I want to welcome everyone to our debate. And of course, I guess most everyone knows that I am Larry Spargimino. For those of you who uh, are not familiar with uh, Southwest Radio Ministries, uh, we began in 1933 here in Oklahoma City. And as far as we can tell, we are the uh, oldest uh, continuously broadcasting Christian radio ministry in the world. So we've been at it for more than 80 years. Um, I am looking forward to this debate, as Kenneth uh, indicated. I hope everyone brought a Bible. There's going to be a lot of Bible in our discussion. And if there is time uh, at the end of the second segment, uh, we will be passing out three by five cards for those who might have a question. Uh, we will not be entertaining questions from the floor, but like I say, if we do have time, I do have three by five cards. You can uh, write your question on the card. Um, allow me to say a few words about both of the participants. Both of these uh, men have been on our broadcast before, both Joel Richardson and Thomas Ice. Uh, both of our uh, participants are strongly premillennial. They both take a futuristic position on uh, eschatology, and they are both very, very strong proponents of uh, God's unconditional covenant with Israel. Uh, both are against replacement theology. Um, Tommy Ice has spoken on this topic many uh, times before, and Joel Richardson has uh, written a book titled, When a Jew rules the world. Uh, this debate, however, focuses on a point of disagreement. What do the scriptures say concerning the Antichrist, his system, and the focus of his empire? So we're going to be looking at, uh, at that uh, issue. Um, I want to introduce uh, both of the speakers very briefly. Uh, Dr. Ice, Tommy Ice, who is behind me, uh, is the executive director of the Pre-Trib Research Center. He's been doing that for 25 years. Uh, he has um, engaged in many, many debates. Um, uh, and we had mentioned Gary DeMore. I think he's debated Gary DeMore nine or eight or nine times. Um, he is very, very well read. Uh, he has spoken on eschatological issues all over the world. He has a tremendous library. He has a lot of material. Uh, at his fingertips. And then Joel Richardson, who is on your left, um, is a New York Times best-selling author, a filmmaker, and internationally recognized teacher. He lives in the United States with his wife and his five children. He has a special love for the uh, people of the Middle East. Uh, he travels globally. He teaches on uh, the gospel living with biblical hope and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Joel has been featured on or written for numerous radio, television, and news outlets across the world and is the author, uh, editor, director, or producer of several books and documentaries. We've offered his books and documentaries before. <laughs> I want to uh, give uh, both parties an opportunity to give a summary of their position. Um, we will allow them uh, 20 minutes, and we will try to give an equal amount of time in, in every question. Um, but Tommy, uh, please give us an overview and summary of your view and um, why you believe it is the correct view. And if you would, for our audience, really frame what uh, you believe. I do believe that the Bible indicates that the Antichrist will be from the revived Roman Empire. And I think unlike Joel's position, which has no biblical basis, it teaches that in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. And so when you look at the book of Daniel, of course, there are passages that teach this. And we see uh, the two visions of the, the, what amounts to the kingdom of man in Daniel chapter 2 and then in Daniel 7, these both indicate that the fourth kingdom is Rome. And uh, so he's given a dream and a vision, and this is the situation where Daniel, who probably could have been 17, 18, 19 years old, goes in there and interprets the dream, and it says that after your kingdom, in other words, your kingdom, you are Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, the first kingdom, 
and after another kingdom inferior to you, uh, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth, and uh, then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. And that fourth kingdom, virtually everyone agrees, now there are some liberals who don't, uh, that this refers to the Roman Empire. And so kingdom is used nine times in this particular passage. Then we see in uh, 240 says, then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these to pieces. And uh, so there is uh, a sense in which it is the strongest and uh, the Bible makes two comments uh, about the obelisk that David, uh, that Daniel uh, and Nebuchadnezzar have seen and one is they decrease in value and secondly they increase in strength. And so the fourth one is represented by iron and in that you saw feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron it will be a divided kingdom. And so this is talking about the later phase of this and by the way the first three kingdoms were taken over by the following kingdom. Rome was not. It dissipates in some way and then it is revived. That's why we call it the revived Roman Empire. And that is the basis for the Antichrist uh, kingdom. And he's now talking about the feet and the toes, which represents that phase of the Roman Empire, the revived Roman Empire, uh, made of clay and partly of iron. And it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron in as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And uh, so, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And uh, he talks here about uh, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will be combined with one another this, of the seed of men. Now, I don't want to get off on showing what this refers to. It does not refer to racial stuff. It refers to cultural stuff. Because in the book of Ruth, we see that God is not opposed to interracial marriage or anything like that. But he's talking about the, the intermarriage of cultures. So that's the seed of man. And that's why what we're seeing today is the attempt to bring together into a global uh, unity uh, all the cultures of the world. But there will, they will not adhere to one another. That's why the iron has to hold that together, even as iron does not combine with pottery. That's the word miry clay in the King James. So you have the head of gold that represents Babylon, uh, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. And Rome is not conquered, but dissipates and is in a revived form, which we believe refers to the tribulation period, which is yet future. And very likely, uh, that is a reference to what is the European Union is perhaps a forerunner to that as God prepares the world through globalism and the revived Roman Empire. And then verse 44 says, this verse 44 says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. The days of those kings does not refer to the Ten Nation Confederacy. It refers to the uh, kings before the four kings. So the, the Bible views this as the kingdom of man, if you will, in various phases. And the kingdom of man is in opposition to the kingdom of God. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all uh, these kingdoms, but itself will endure forever. So this is when the stone comes and crushes the final phase, and there's some sense in which uh, the contributions of all the multiple kingdoms are integrated into that last kingdom, and thus when it strikes uh, the feet, then the entire uh, attempts of the kingdom of man is destroyed. And so verse 45 says, Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, 
the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so that the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And we see this dream repeated in chapter 7. So we see uh, the times of the Gentiles begins with Babylon where Gentile nations are going to dominate. And then God gives a second vision, this time to Daniel himself. And this time it is God's perspective of the king of man and it looks like a beast. He describes it in terms of beast. Uh, when you have man's fallen sinful human nature uh, plus Satan stirring it up then that equals a beastly nature and aspect that we're seeing even more today in our own day as, as the world's being prepared for it. And so here Daniel is talking about after this I kept looking in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. And so there's the connection with uh, the Daniel 2, that this fourth phase of the kingdom has iron teeth, meaning it's, it's the strongest of those. And it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and uh, meaning it took over the other kingdoms. It, uh, and it was different from all the beasts which were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, a lot of people like to speculate back in Daniel 2 about the ten toes being the ten kingdoms. And that, that probably is true, but the, the text of Daniel 2 does not emphasize that. The ten-nation confederacy is emphasized uh, in the uh, chapter 7 version of it in the beast. And it says, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boast. And of course, now the focus is, is on an individual person, which is the Antichrist here, the little horn. In chapter 8, the Antichrist is Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of the Antichrist, but uh, the identification in chapter 8 of the little horn is different in, in that sense from the one we see here in chapter 7. And that's referring to, pulled up by its roots, the military takeover as we find from other passages in Daniel uh, of those. And then in verse 11 and 12 it says, Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed, and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, you know, and, and this is reiterated in the book of Revelation. So here's a summary. It's expanded upon in Revelation 20, uh, when the destiny of the beast is explained in more detail. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. And we know that that's seven year period uh, that they're going to reign and rule. And uh, these four beasts, of course, represent, uh, are explained in verse 16. I approached one of those who was standing by and asking him uh, the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. And very clearly, he says in verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. And, uh, you know, in the book of Revelation, it's got the emphasis on earth dwellers. Their focus is on the earth as opposed to heaven dwellers, which is used two or three times uh, to focus on God's will that comes out of heaven and all of this kind of stuff. And so we see in verse 18, but the saints of the highest one, and in the context, this is Jewish believers, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Just like the stone cut without hand, meaning of divine origins, God's kingdom comes, intervenes in history. We know this is the second coming and sets up uh, God's kingdom. So here we see that uh, he is going to do the same thing. This is parallel to that stone cut without hands in chapter 2. In verse 19, Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. See, so the, he was exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron, 
and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And so here it's pictured as a, as a composite. And in Revelation, as we'll see in a moment, in 13, 2, it presents the same composite. Therefore, indicating that in some sense, all aspects of these four kingdoms are uh, represented in the final form of the revived Roman Empire here. And so this iterates that as well. And so then we see the meaning of the ten horns that were on the head and the other horns which came up and before which three of them fell, namely, and that's the idea that the first three were defeated by the subsequent kingdoms. Rome, of course, uh, defeated uh, the Greek Empire and it was not defeated by humans necessarily, according to this biblical picture. That horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, so that's referring to the final form, the Antichrist form, a boast, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. And so we see that this comes out of the, the Roman phase of the empire. That's why historically, from the early church onward, people have generally thought that the uh, revived Roman Empire would have some uh, role to play in the end times. And then we see in verses 21 and 22, I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, in other words, the Jewish people. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. And this is, of course, the millennial kingdom. And in verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. I, I believe it's referring to uh, the Antichrist kingdom that rules over the whole world, the entire world. Verse 24, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Now, this is talking about the ten-nation confederacy that arises, and then the little horn arises within it, the Antichrist, who takes over this ten-nation confederacy, three militarily and the others through uh, verbal persuasion, if we want, could say that. And verse 25, and he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, time, and half a time. That's three and a half years. That's the last three and a half years, uh, as we know from the book of Revelation, where the Antichrist goes into the temple, sets up his thing, and... Uh, Sets up, it goes from being a regional power, in my opinion, to a global power during those last three and a half years. And so we see uh, the judgment of the Antichrist and, uh, in 726, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And so this is what you always see at the end of the Antichrist uh, kingdom is God intervenes directly and destroys it. And that ends the times of the Gentiles. That ends the uh, attempts by Satan to uh, bring the kingdom of man in. And it is always associated with a phase of the revived Roman Empire. And so here's simply a graphic that shows the coordination uh, between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and their things talking about the same exact uh, images. And we see Daniel 70 weeks, and that is uh, weeks of years, and the first 483 years were fulfilled literally to the day of the triumphal entry. And then Messiah was cut off. And notice it says, uh, after the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. In other words, not during the 70th week, but after the 69th week. And therefore, that means uh, three or four days after the triumphal entry, which ended the 433 years of the first 69 weeks of years, then the Messiah was cut off. And that's an excellent description of his death. And then it says, and have nothing. 
And what they have nothing, you have to give a textual reason. A lot of people, you read commentaries, they don't have any clue as to what that refers to. It clearly refers back to verse 24 and the six things that will be the result when the 70 weeks of years are completed. And so it's getting late. God may be slow, but he's never late. And here th- uh, at the first coming of Christ, after 69 weeks of years, he had none of those six things in verse 24. And then you have the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And so literally the text reads, the subject of the sentence is the people, not the prince who is to come in the original Hebrew. Thus it is the people of the prince who is to come that will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Everybody knows that's the Romans. And it was the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70 under the leadership of Titus. Yet the phrase who is to come is a reference to the yet to come Antichrist. And so that is support. As Dr. Pentecost says, the ruler who will come is that final head of the Roman Empire, the little horn of 7-8. It, uh, Daniel 7, 8. It is significant that the people of the ruler, not the ruler himself, will destroy Jerusalem. Since he will be the final Roman ruler, the people of that ruler must be the Romans themselves. And uh, so it then talks about uh, making a firm covenant with the many. By the way, the phrase the many is a technical term used in the book of Daniel to always refer to the Jewish people or a remnant. Some people go off into Never Never Land on that phrase for one week, in other words, seven years. But in the middle of the week, that's where you get in Daniel 7 and on in the New Testament, the three and a half year period, because that's half of seven years. He will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And this is saying that he's going to be destroyed, this person. So it couldn't have been AD, uh, AD 70 where Titus went back and became ruler of Rome, I think 12 or 17 years or something like that, and uh, you know died a natural death. This is talking about the one who makes the abomination of desolation, which is described by the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is setting up uh, his image in God's temple. We see that in Revelation 13. Uh, Then he's the one who's going to be destroyed directly by God. So this is still a future time, the 70th week. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ice, for his uh, um, founding principles, uh, defending the revived Roman Empire view. And I ought to uh, point out that that is the very popular view, Tim LaHaye, um, Hal Lindsey, and Noah Hutchings held to that view. But uh, Joel, um, give us uh, an overview and summary of the view that you hold and the scriptures that um, you would like to point out. Sure. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here. It's a blessing to be here. It's an honor to be here. I just want to begin by thanking Southwest Radio Ministries, of course, uh, for sponsoring this event and uh, Larry Spargimino for sort of spearheading it. Um, This is uh, a debate, uh, a discussion uh, that I've wanted to have for probably over a decade. And um, I've invited various prophecy teachers to have the discussion. And um, there have been different ones that have been happy to travel around the country and give messages critical of myself, messages that have revolved around myself and what I'm teaching. Um, but none that would be willing to actually sit on the platform and defend it. So thank you very much to Tommy for um, having the uh, dispensational chutzpah to um, lay it all on the line. So I'm I'm grateful for this uh, opportunity. Well, actually, let me just say this. This is the first debate that I've ever done. So I asked Tommy. Tommy's first debate was in 88. I was a junior in high school. Um, So I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, but, um, yeah. So in any case, Islam is forcing its irrelevance on all of us. And I just think it's critical. I think it's absolutely critical that the body of Christ is wrestling with these things, that we are peering into the scriptures, weighing through these things, discussing them together, chewing them over and having these kind of discussions because we, as the body of Christ, we want to know how to respond. We want to know how to respond to these things. You know, um, I was listening to, a. Uh, interview that Tommy did with Berean, uh, Berean Call Radio just a few months ago, 
And he, he said, well, probably what's going to happen is that Islam is going to probably be wiped out. That was the phrase he used. It's going to be wiped out. Now, what I'm saying is that Islam is the single greatest challenge that we are going to face as the body of Christ before he returns. Now, these are two profoundly very different visions and how we respond to something that's about to be wiped out versus something that is our greatest challenge is profound. I mean, the, the pastoral implications, the missiological implications, just the very real world implications of how we relate to this is critical. And so this discussion is relevant. I was, what I was going to say with regard to the debates is I'm not sure how much confidence I have in debates. Um, I'm hoping that this goes well and that, uh, you know, everyone is edified, um, you know, to a degree. And I, this is probably a bad thing to do, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to start by insulting the whole audience. Um, <laughs> You know, to a degree, I think debates, I'll be honest, in other words, if, you, if you've come here to settle this issue, um, then you're being lazy. Uh, debates are good to come and sort of dip your toes in the water and get a feel for this, but ultimately there's something that you can do to really work through these things, and this is what Bereans do, and it's called reading. And so it's good that we've come together and spent three hours. I mean, we'll probably just kind of skim a rock over the surface of a lot of these critical texts. Uh, but it is critical that we dig in a lot deeper. And so that, that was what I wanted to say is, you know, debates are wonderful. Um, I think they can bear good fruit, but we, we do. We want to go a bit deeper. Let me just ask this before, by the way, just before we, I jump in. How many people here very strongly lean toward the Roman Antichrist theory? He's going to come out of the Roman Empire. So, and then how many lean pretty strongly toward the Islamic Antichrist theory? Maybe just a teeny bit more. And then how many are pretty much undecided, not really sure, on the fence? So it's you know, fairly evenly divided. We'll ask the question again at the end. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see how fruitful debates are and see how many people have been swayed. But um, uh, I asked Tommy beforehand, you know, he made the statement as he was opening. He said, Joel Richardson has no biblical basis for his position. Now, before the debate, I asked Tommy, I said, have you read my book, Mideast Beast? His answer was, no, I haven't read it. He wasn't even sure what it was. Now, the subtitle of this book is The Scriptural Case for the Islamic Antichrist. So the chapters of this book, uh, if you open it up, it should pretty much reflect what we're discussing today. We've got Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, 26, Daniel 8, Daniel 10, 11, 12, etc. I wrote a whole book laying out the scriptural case for an Islamic Antichrist. Now, a few months ago, uh, Tommy was at a Bible church, and he gave a whole message and the pictures of myself and criticizing my um, position. And in an article on his own website, he said, I'm one of the most extreme newspaper exegetes out there today. Now, let me ask you a question. There's a proverb that says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is his folly and shame. Dr. Ice has not read my book. He doesn't know what I teach. He hasn't even taken the time to look at it. Is it am I right? No. I, did you not present your book scripturally in your first book? No, I wrote a book called The Islamic Antichrist, but that is not an encyclopedic treatment of the scriptural case. For Islam. That, essentially, what I'm doing in that book is laying out what does Islam teach and how does it parallel many of the things that the Bible teaches. But I've written another book here called The Scriptural Case. So listen, I just want to say this. It's important to be Bereans. It's, this is important. But I don't think it's proper to criticize another teacher if you haven't actually taken the time to see what they teach. OK, so you read one of my books. I appreciate that. But now let's just begin by laying the foundation for what I see as the scriptural case for an Islamic Antichrist. So first of all, my position begins with a very simple thesis, the very, very simple fact that this book, the book that we, this is our authority, this book is thoroughly, it always has been, thoroughly Jerusalem and Israel centric. You know, as much as it, to a degree, it drives Americans crazy, we think the world revolves around us. Um, we think that God's world should revolve around us. This book is not primarily about us. This book is primarily about Jerusalem and Israel and the larger Middle East. And it's not to say that we're not relevant to the Bible, 
but it's not primarily about us. There is a very clear geographic context to this book. And the first rule in careful, responsible, biblical interpretation of any text, and the, lar the larger Bible in general, is you have to determine the context. So we begin with the context that the story, particularly of the last days, it revolves around Jerusalem. This is the spot that Jesus is coming back to restore the throne of David. Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel, Acts 1, as the disciples asked him. That's true. That's happening. Now, if you look at a map today, I've got a map of the Middle East. I put a star of David there. That's the spot that God has chosen to rule the earth from when Jesus returns. Now, when you look at the nations in black or dark green all around the nation of Israel, those are the Muslim-majority nations of the earth. So when we take into context the fact that this story revolves around that Star of David, that it revolves around the throne of David, then all we have to do is look at a map. And we can see very clearly that Satan has been surrounding the throne of David for the past 1,400 years. He is well aware of biblical prophecy. He knows what the Bible teaches. And the Islamic world is not irrelevant. It's not, yes, it came along after the Bible, but yes, the Bible did foresee it. The Lord was not blind to the fact that the single greatest antichrist religion, the largest, most antichrist religion, the most anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, violent religion that mankind has ever known, he was not blind to the fact that it was coming. And as a result of that, when we look at the prophets, when we look at the consistent testimony of the prophets throughout the Bible, they are repeatedly naming names. They are pointing to tribes. They are pointing to peoples. They are pointing to nations that surround Israel. And the Lord names names. Every single time that he names names, they are Middle Eastern or North African Muslim majority nations every single time. Now listen, we're going to get into Daniel 2. We're going to get into Daniel 9.26, which Tommy has discussed. But another rule of biblical interpretation is you don't start right out with the prophetic, the apocalyptic, the symbolic. You begin with that which is clear. You begin with that which is abundant. You begin with that which is replete throughout the scriptures. The Middle Eastern nations that will be judged, now please listen to this, that will be judged in the context, at the time of the return of Jesus, are always as being Middle Eastern majority nations. Joel chapter 3, hasten and come all you surrounding nations. The phrase there is goyim saviv. It's a very specific phrase, the nations round about. It has a specific meaning. It means the neighboring nations. These are the nations that surround Israel in the last days. Gather yourselves together there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up. Come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I, the Lord, will sit to judge the goyim saviv, the surrounding nations. Okay, so we begin with references vague, such as this, Zechariah 12, 2. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all of the surrounding peoples. The Am Saviv, the, the peoples roundabout. That's more of an ethnic denotation. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. Numbers 24. Here is sort of the first reference in the Old Testament where the Lord begins naming names. Now, we all know Genesis 3.15, right? The fall happened. Uh, and as soon as the fall happens, the Lord steps in and he speaks to the serpent. And he says, listen, you are going to bruise his heel. You're going to merely bruise his heel. He is going to crush your head. The Lord introduces the concept of the Messiah. He just, who is it? It's mysterious. It's he. Who's this he? And the Lord says to the serpent, you know, I'm going to put enmity between uh, your seed and the seed of the woman. And then he introduces this mysterious he. He is going to crush your head. He's talking about the Messiah. You are merely going to strike or bruise his heel. Now, here in Numbers 24, we have the story of um, Balak and Balaam. Balak was the king of the Moabites. The Moabites were the kingdom that today would be in central Jordan, just to the uh, east of Israel. And the Hebrews had come up out of uh, Egypt, and they were encroaching upon the Moabite territory. And Balak was very upset, so he pays Balaam to curse 
the Hebrews, and they're up on this great overlook. They're looking down at the Hebrews, and Balaam begins to prophesy. And what does he say? He says, now behold, and I'm skipping through just to, for brevity. I will advise you, Balaam says, he says to Balak, I will advise you what this people, that's the Hebrews, will do to your people, that's the Moabites, in the days to come. And the phrase there is uh, akarith yom, it's, the, it's the, the latter days. It doesn't always mean the last days, but it generally does. It's sort of the latter days. And he begins to prophesy. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. He begins to speak about the coming Messiah. What does he say? A star will come up out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. So now the Messiah is not nearly the one that's going to crush. Now it's a king of Israel. We know that the crushing one is a king of Israel. And what is he going to do? He will crush the foreheads of Moab. Now, contrary to the notion that Moab gets wiped out before the return of Jesus, Moab, now again, this is not ethnic. This, the Lord uses the ancient names and the regions of the peoples to point to the geographic regions uh, where the emphasis of his judgments will be in the last days. This is not about some DNA testing, whether or not you have Moabite in you. And then it goes on. It says, he will crush all the skulls of the sons of Sheth. See, the crushing one. The Lord starts naming names. Edom will be conquered. Mount Seir, which is the capital of Edom, will be conquered. On the other hand, Israel will grow strong. Here's a map of the region. Um, Edom is more concentrated up toward modern-day Jordan, but it did extend down a bit into northwest Saudi Arabia because some references say all the way down to Dedan, from Timan to Dedan, as it defines Edom, and that's central Saudi Arabia today. So there's the initial emphasis of the Lord's judgments. It's not Europe. Ezekiel 30, uh, verse 1 through 5, Thus saith the Lord God, Wail, alas, for the day. For the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. Now, is this talking about today? No, this is talking about the context of the day of the Lord. It will be a day of clouds, a day of doom for the nations. A sword shall come upon France. Egypt. Egypt. Anguish shall be in Cush, that's Sudan, that's south of Egypt. When the slain shall fall in Egypt, Cush and Put and Lud. Lud is Lydia. That's Western Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. All of Arabia and Libya and the people of the land that is in league. They shall fall by the sword. The names that the Lord uses, once again, we look at a map. Those are the nations that surround Israel. They tell the same story that Joel is telling. They tell the same story that Zechariah is telling. They tell the same story that Balaam is telling. Micah 5, we all know the prophecy, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will be ruler over Israel. There he is, the ruler of Israel, the crushing one, the Messiah that will crush the serpent. Now, this is where we learn he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And this was referenced in the New Testament. Where is the Messiah going to be born? In Bethlehem. Now, what does it say about the Bethlehem-born Messiah? It says his origins are from of old, from ancient times. Skipping forward, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of Yahweh, in the majesty of the name of Yahweh his God. He will deliver us from the Assyrian when he invades our land and marches into our borders. Now, do you guys remember that part in the Gospels where Jesus delivers the Israelites from the Assyrian? It hasn't happened yet, has it? This is clearly a prophecy about the Bethlehem-born Messiah. Now, in the sermon that Tommy gave at the Bible Church, he said, well, Joel says this is about the Antichrist. It's not. This is historical. This is completely fulfilled in history. Here's a quote from the New American commentary, Kenneth Barker. Uh, he says, who is this ruler? There is near consensus that he is none other than the Messiah. All the ancient Jewish interpreters regarded the ruler as the Messiah. Jewish and Christian interpreters understand that this is a messianic prophecy. And you read the passage, it says he will deliver Israel from the invasion of the Assyrian. Now what some people do is they just take a very loose interpretation. They go, well, this is just speaking in general of all of the end time enemies of, of God and of Israel. And I go, okay, that's awfully general. That's awfully general, but it's clearly referring to the Antichrist. And it clearly calls him the Assyrian. Now, as Bereans, because there's a range of, of ways that we can understand and interpret this, as Bereans who are faithful to the text, 
I want to ask you this question. Is it more likely that because the Antichrist is called the Assyrian, I don't think we have to go so rigidly literal that he has to be a bloodline Assyrian. I think that's going too far in the other direction. I think when we go so far, just, it just vaguely means the enemies of God and there's no meaning to the Assyrian whatsoever. I think we've gone too far in the other direction. But is it more reasonable to conclude that the Antichrist will probably come out of the area of the Assyrian Empire? Here's a map which includes the greater Middle East extending from Turkey all the way over to Iran. Is that more reasonable or is it more reasonable to conclude that he'll probably be Nikolai Carpathia from Romania? What is more in keeping with the text? I want you to honestly ask yourselves that question. Who is sticking with the word of God? Or is it more reasonable to conclude that this guy is probably the Assyrian? Right? Is that biblical? Is that, is that an idea that's rooted in the text? We all know the passage that speaks about the return of Jesus, you know, the quintessential passage in Revelation 19, he returns in fire and blazing glory with all the armies of heaven with him. We all know this passage. Uh, but rarely do we look at the Old Testament passages upon which that text is based upon. His robes are soaked in blood. Whose blood is it, by the way? Everyone will say, well, it's his blood or it's the blood of the martyrs. It's the blood of his enemies. Because that text is taken directly from Isaiah 63. Isaiah is in Jerusalem. He's looking south down toward Edom, and he sees this majestic figure. He says, who is this coming up from Germany? Oh, no, wait. From Edom. From Basra. That's the region of southern Jordan, that region of northwest Saudi Arabia, southern Jordan, with his garments stained crimson. Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I. Speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Isaiah says, why are your garments red like those one treading the wine press? Why do you look like you've been in a wine press stomping grapes? He says, I have trod in the wine press alone. I'm coming up out of Edom, the Arab world. The, from the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger. I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered all my garments. I stained all my clothing. Why? Is the Lord... Hate Arabs? Absolutely not. The Lord is defending and protecting his people, who he identifies with and takes personal offense when people harbor what's called the everlasting hatred in opposition to the everlasting covenant that he made with Abraham. And the Lord says, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption. You can hear him say, has finally come. The Lord has executed vengeance on behalf of Israel. He's coming up out of Edom with his robes soaked in blood. Now, some people say, well, that's where all of the European armies. You've got about two minutes for this opening okay. section. Um, so let me just say this. We can look at multiple passages throughout the prophets. These passages are literal. These are not the apocalyptic texts. Now, we're going to get into the legs of iron and the beasts and the horns and all of those things. We have to understand those. But if the symbolic apocalyptic texts that you interpret violate the clear, consistent, literal testimony from the beginning of the book until the end, then you probably have a problem with your eschatology. Now, to be clear, guys, I'm not saying everybody ignore the Roman paradigm. I think as watchers, we need watchers on both sides of the walls. I just think this idea that anyone who is on the wall, Eastern wall, in considering the value of the Middle Eastern or Islamic end time paradigm, the idea that that's just irrelevant, senseless newspaper exegesis, not rooted in the scriptures, that's nonsense. It's dishonest. You know, um, you're familiar with Walter Kaiser Jr. I know. Yeah. I mean, a legendary Old Testament scholar. Um, Walter Kaiser endorsed my book. He said, here is a most engaging book. There is much to commend the arguments for a final Islamic empire rather than a Western or Roman empire in the day of the Lord. There is much to commend this argument. I'm not saying that this is the end all, that this is the answer. Disregard everything Tommy's saying. I'm saying as the body of Christ, there is value here that we need to be considering in light of what's unfolding on the earth. When we look at all of these other texts, we'll see. When you go to a store, you buy a glove. It doesn't count. You don't buy it if two fingers fit. You buy a glove, all the fingers fit. 
When we look at the Islamic end time paradigm, we'll see that it causes all of the difficult passages to flow together smoothly. They sense. No, it's not the it's not the most traditional position. I fully understand that, but it is the most biblical position. And we have to have the courage to face what the scriptures say and then stand with what the scriptures say. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, Tommy, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to his opening comments, if you'd like to. Uh, he begins his talk by talking about current events and the rise of Islam you know, there's a lot of issues that, uh, you know, are occurring contemporarily, but uh, I believe you have to go to the Bible to first get your uh, framework and then look at current events. I do believe in looking at current events, but you have to develop from the scripture first and through inductive exegesis your uh, view of these things, and that's why we go to those passages. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, uh, I was going to go to Revelation 13. Revelation 17, Daniel 9, because those are passages that talk about the Antichrist. It talks about where he comes from and uh, things. He, uh, so, did Joel's early book on the Islamic Antichrist not deal with Scripture? Well, yes, it did. And I'm sorry I didn't read your later book. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you presented arguments there. Were they wrong, that, so wrong that they needed to be updated and changed in your later edition? But I did read your book. I also watched some videos, uh, you know, where he articulated his view and those kinds of things. And uh, Joel's view seems to be based upon saying, well, all of these nations in the Bible, which I don't disagree, you know, that are mentioned in the last days are currently Islamic nations. Well, they are. Uh, but those passages do not talk about where the Antichrist is coming from. The Antichrist, you know, that's nice to know. Uh, I know Walid Shabbat's mother made a big deal out of that. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, when you're looking at passages that talk about the Antichrist, who the anti where he's coming from, you have to go to passages that talk about that. And uh, I'm in total agreement with Joel's lesson on Messianic prophecy, by the way. And uh, at least as far as he articulated it today. And Isaiah 63, 1 through 3, I believe, if you look in our chart book that Tim Lai and I did, we believe that it's one of the phases of the campaign of Armageddon where the Jews have gone to Petra, which is in Edom, and he comes first to rescue Israel, uh, which has been hidden away, as Revelation 12 indicates, and m many other Old Testament passages before he comes and makes his victory ascent on the Mount of Olives. So I agree, he's coming there and he tramples the winepress of God, it says, alone. And that's why when he comes in Revelation 19, he's got blood on his garments because he's first been to Basra, uh, which is a village right next to Petra, even to this day. And later, after Isaiah gave that prophecy, the Edomians built the city of Petra. And uh, very likely the Jews are going to be hid away during the last three and a half years in Petra, in the wilderness. And so, you know, I don't see how that's a support for his view. He mentioned a lot of passages, but I think the Syrian Antichrist is the only argument he made for his view. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 together, which I fully agree with Tommy, uh, Daniel 7 is essentially a reiteration of the same story being told in Daniel 2 using different symbolism, adding some different lessons and so forth, but basically a reiteration. Uh, together they form one of the two pillars of the Roman Antichrist theory. The other one is Daniel 9.26. The idea is that the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, as Tommy just explained to you, as well as the fourth beast, that the idea is that that's the Roman Empire. Now, I just want to start by saying the Jewish view is that it's not a Roman Empire, but an Edomite, Esau, kingdom. I've got a quote there. This is from a commentary on Ezekiel. It says, the Midrash comments that these ten horns symbolize ten kings of the fourth kingdom. 
The eleventh horn is the final king who Israel will confront. All these kings, the Midrash stresses, are to be descendants of Esau. Now, I don't believe they're bloodline descendants, but they see it as a, essentially an Arab kingdom. So that's the Jewish view. Now, the Christian view has always been that the fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. I always held to that view. I always held to the view that I learned from you know, all of my teachers uh, who I stand on their shoulders, including Tommy Ice. I've referenced his articles many times, deeply appreciate many of the things that he's written. Um, I'll just touch that very briefly. When Tommy was teaching, he said that I teach that it's the eastern leg and the western leg, and that I say it's the eastern leg. I've never taught that. I don't teach that. I don't even know where he got that. And in another statement, he said, I teach the fourth kingdom is Greece. I go, I've never taught that either. I don't know where he got that. I've always taught that the fourth kingdom is the Islamic caliphate, the Islamic caliphate. So in Daniel 2, verse 40, it says the fourth kingdom. Now notice the scriptures never name the fourth kingdom. The Lord in his wisdom never saw fit to name that which we have named. Now, if you open up your Bibles, you'll see that many of the subheadings will say, Rome, well, it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It just calls it the fourth kingdom. So what we have to do is we have to look at the criteria that the scriptures have given us and say, does this match Rome? And so in verse uh, 40, it says, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Well, I agree with Tommy. The others are Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Did the Roman Empire crush all the others? Well, people will say, well, it, it sort of conquered Greece, which had previously conquered, and they kind of do that. That's like saying, look, if the Ravens beat the Cowboys, beat the you know, Colts, beat the Dolphins, that means you know, that the, what did I start with? The Ravens beat the Colts or whatever, right? And I go, no, that's not how it works. That's what the Super Bowl is for, and that's not what the text says. It doesn't say one would defeat the next. It says it would crush all of the others. That's what the text says. So here's the Babylonian Empire. And the red dot is the city of Babylon. Now, who was this dream given to? What is the context of this passage? It was given to Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ruler of Mesopotamia. What was it concerning? It was concerning three kingdoms that would come after and crush his. Not merely world kingdoms that would come after and replace his. So the next one, clearly, we agree, is the Medo-Persian Empire. That happened within the timeline of the book of Daniel. After that, Alexander sweeps across from Macedonia, conquers the whole Middle East. Clearly, that was the third kingdom. Then we get to the Roman Empire. Do you guys remember the Sesame Street little bit? You know, which one of these kids is doing his own thing? Which one of these kids is not like the other? Remember that? Am I the only one? I was watching that when Tommy was doing his first debate. Um, <laughs> not quite. I was a little bit older. Still watching in high school. But so here's a map of the Roman Empire. In 16, under Emperor Trajan, Trajan wanted to be the next Alexander, and he conquered that whole area up north called Armenia. And then the next year, he came down the Tigris, and he took the ruinous city of Babylon, and then he had a stroke. He had some problems back in the West, and he turned around and died. Hadrian, his general, took over and forever established the, the uh, easternmost border of the Roman Empire, as you see it here. So, yes, the Roman Empire reached that Babylon, but it never put down roots. It was never able to lay hold of that area. So, you know, when I visit with my friends uh, in Iran, I say, well, the Bible says that this fourth kingdom would crush all the others, including Persia, Iran. Did the Roman Empire crush your kingdom? And they're like, no. No, the Roman Empire did not crush us. Here's the Islamic Caliphate. It's the only other empire in history that we have to choose from. Did it crush all the others? Did it crush Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece? Absolutely, completely. Listen, guys, we don't take a position that requires multiple shoehorns. Scripture is always fulfilled precisely. Now, here's a map that shows all of the areas that were crushed, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, and then all of the areas that weren't. The Roman Empire crushed maybe one quarter of the others. It doesn't fit. It doesn't meet the biblical criteria the Islamic Empire does. Okay. Uh, so you use the Jewish Midrash to interpret scripture, uh, especially prophecy. Uh, the Jews have a very different eschatological view based on their limited 
thing. So I wouldn't use Jewish Midrash to interpret a portion of the Old Testament. Also, uh, I got that information that you mentioned from our debate about the, uh, on the Moody Network uh, on the radio about that was certainly the clear impression I got uh, was that you believe the, um, in fact, you, you talked about uh, some of the details of the, um, you know, arguing for the Greeks, uh, Seleucid Kingdom and all of this kind of stuff. At least that's what I understood you to say. Also, uh, crush doesn't necessarily mean, I don't think in the context, that they took every piece of land that was in the previous empire. It means they replaced that empire. Uh, in other words, the uh, successive replacement of each empire. Now, in the first empire in Daniel, he says that you've been given the whole world. Well, did, did Nebuchadnezzar take over the whole world? No, he did not. But apparently, had he kept going in his conquering, uh, it was available to him. And uh, so each successive empire had different borders and things like this, but they kept getting bigger and they were replacing and they kept moving more westward, by the way. So by the time you get to the fourth kingdom, it's clearly Rome, and that is reiterated when we deal with the New Testament passages. All right, thank you. Let's move on to uh, Daniel 9, 26. I think it's a key issue. Uh, in verse 26, we read, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, Tom, I want to start with you. Uh, you did mention that verse in your opening. Um, first of all, is this uh, an historical event or is it future? And then secondly, uh, who in particular are the people of the prince that shall come? Now, you addressed that before, but maybe just develop it a little bit, and I want to have a response from Joe, so you start. Well, it's clearly historical, of course, because uh, he's dealing with literal years, and, you know, I've got here the, uh, when it starts, the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy starts, and this points out the very time when Messiah would show up. This is an important passage uh, vindicating that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah because the decree, Artaxerxes' decree in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8, which is the only decree that fits the statement in Daniel 9, uh, began on March 5th, 444 B.C., adjusting to, from the lunar to the solar calendar. And, of course, that ends on the very day, the 490, 83 years, or the 7 plus 62 years of weeks, on March 30th, AD 33, the very day of the triumphal entry. In fact, Christ in Luke 19 says, had you known the time of your visitation, that which makes for a blessing, then uh, you know how would they have known the time of their visitation? Well, from Daniel. And uh, he says, but instead, and he talks about the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. And so it says after, I believe in verse 26, after that time period, the Messiah will be cut off. And so there, there it is, four days later, the Messiah was crucified, uh, not in the 70 weeks of 70th week of Daniel, <laughs> but after the 69th week of years. And then it also says, after the 69 weeks of years, the city and the temple will be destroyed. And it was destroyed, as everyone knows, on the 9th of Av, the same calendar day that the first temple was destroyed, on August 6, AD 70, uh, by the Romans. And so that passage, of course, says that the people of the prince who is to come, and I pointed out the... Um, the grammar there, whoops, let me go back, yeah, right here. Um, the subject of this sentence is the people in the original language, not the prince who is to come. The English translators, it apparently is rendered better in English, but there it's the people, and then he talks about the prince who is to come as a sub-clause under that. Thus, it is the people of the prince who is to come. And so it's a reference to the future uh, to 
the Romans, who every, I know Joel would admit, destroyed the city and the sanctuary in AD 70 under the leadership of Titus. And uh, so the prince who is to come is a reference to the Antichrist because in the next verse, it's he's that, the he is the nearest antecedent back to the prince who is to come. And so this is a exegetical scriptural passage that indicates that the Antichrist will be a Roman. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Joel, uh, two questions again about 926. Is it historical, and who are the people of the prince that shall come? Five minutes. You got five? Okay. So first of all, um, the historical grammatical method says that we have to look at the words. It's am. It's am nagi, the people of the prince. Strong, Strong's lexicon lists the meaning of am as nation, people, or kindred. Uh, Wilhelm Gesenius, Hebrew scholar in his lexicon, he lists the primary meaning as races, tribes, race, or family, kindred, relatives. Arnold Fruchtenbaum states, we are dealing here with a bloodline, not a country. Now I want you to ask yourselves this question. If you leave here today and you get mugged, the police come and they say, who mugged you? And you say, officer, it was seven Americans. What did you just tell the police officer? Nothing. The word there is an ethnic denotation. Now, in AD 16, um, under Augustus, he began a series of reforms because the Roman Empire was all about, the, it was just really a city. The thing was nothing but a giant revenue collection system. They built smooth roads, they conquered people, send taxes back so that we can get fat, get, you know, become homosexuals and just live lives of perversion. Well, after a while, you don't want to serve in the military, so they started outsourcing their military and they started raising up the provincial peoples. The Roman Empire, just like the United States, it was a, a you know, a commonwealth. It was made up of numerous different arms, different peoples. So you can't say they were Roman. What does that mean? They're from the city of Rome? So therefore they must be Italians? The people of the Antichrist are gonna be Italians? How many, I don't think Larry, Larry likes that very much, right? Um, no, that's not what it's saying. And now look, if it is the ethnic denotation, I've done a thorough study. See this stack right here? This is the stack of books that I worked through to look at the ethnic makeup of the armies in 70 AD that destroyed Jerusalem. Overwhelmingly, they were Greek Syrians, they were called Syrians by Josephus, and Arabs. It was the vast majority. Yes, it was carried out by Titus, they were their master, but you know something, when you actually read Josephus, here's one reference, I'll just read it. Uh, it says, the multitude of the Arabians with the Syrians cut up those that came out as supplicants and searched through their bellies. People were swallowing gold and silver and they were dissecting the deserters. Who was? The Romans, the Arabians, the Syrians. These were the Roman soldiers. There was almost two legions of Arab volunteers. Four different Arab kings brought uh, volunteers, auxiliaries, and were part of that. Um, here is a reference from Josephus. He says, now a certain person came running up to Titus and told him the, that the temple was on fire. Did Titus say, burn it down? Whereupon he rose in great haste, and as he was, he ran to the holy house in order to have a stop put to the fire. And after them, the several legions in great astonishment, in a which was natural when there was such a motion of so many people, then calling to the soldiers that were fighting with a loud voice, giving them a signal with his hands, order them to quench the fire, put the fire out. And then it said, again, the Arabs and the Syrians, their passions were too hard. They had for Caesar and read their master, their Caesar, as was their hatred of the Jews. The temple was not burnt down because of Titus's command. It was burnt down because of the hatred of Arab and Syrian burnt the city down. This is not a very good pillar. We've looked at Daniel 2. That pillar, I'm sorry, but it's not very firm. This pillar is not very firm. His entire edifice is built on these two pillars. 
And these pillars don't work with the clear text that we looked at when we with the Islamic paradigm. They fit perfectly. And I think we all need to take these passages very seriously and look at them, perhaps a little bit under the surface, do a little more homework. And I've done that quite thoroughly in Mideast Peace. Look at what really took place. One of the things you'll discover is that what he's saying is very similar to what the preterists and Gary DeMar and all these other people teach, uh, Ken Gentry. Uh, and he, ta he obfuscates the passage by wrongly emphasizing this particular nature of the word. I don't disagree that that's the nuance of the word, but it's very clear. And by the way, he also said that the destruction of the temple in 8070 was outside the 70 weeks of years. He said that. Uh, those of you that watch this later on can reverse it and check that he said that. I made a big point out of after the 62 weeks is what the text actually says. And that means at the end of the 69 weeks of years, and I showed you the diagram that this happened after the 69 weeks of years. So if, if he said it happened, the full 70 weeks of years are completed, then that would mean there's no basis for a seven-year tribulation because that's the postponement. It's talking about the Messiah's uh, two careers, his first coming at the end of the 69 weeks of years, and then the postponement because the Messiah has postponed his coming, and then by the end of the 70th week of years, it, it will be fulfilled. And We've got a lot of other material. Um, we, we are going to take a break. and we, We've got a lot of material in Ezekiel 38 and uh, Revelation 13 and so forth. But um, I wanted to ask uh, Tommy uh, before the break and get a, a response from, from Joel. Obviously, both of you have some very different views. I know there have, has been some strong language. Um, so, Tommy, do you think uh, Joel's views should be labeled heretical, or would you consider them unorthodox? Because, you know, you you do have a very influential position as the director of the pre-trib and your associations with Tim LaHaye. So, uh, how do you consider his views after even hearing him at this open session? Historically, heretical refers to people that do not agree with church creeds. I believe his view is unbiblical because it's not what the Bible teaches, so it's wrong. You know, um, in his article on his own website, he referred to, um, he said, there's no way that Joel... ...is that DV... You know, there's, there's language here that's being used to cause people not to pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't read Joel's books. Don't arguments. The spirit of a Berean checks all things. Now, I, I fully respect if Tommy doesn't agree with my view. He says it's unbiblical. To him means I don't agree with him. Um, but to use language like that, it's not helpful. It's not respectful, in my opinion, to you. It's certainly not respectful to me. Um, I don't think it's Christ-like. I don't think it's mature. I don't think there's any room for that kind of language, for that type of rhetoric. If you want to disagree Defend your position biblically. That's what, that's what we're here for right now, and I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. But um, I think I've already demonstrated, and the fact that I've been endorsed, you know, Tommy said we have to be inductive. Kay Arthur read my book. I sat down with her. She said, Joel, you completely convinced me. She's the Mrs. Inductive Bible Study. I think this is something we all need to be taking seriously without just sort of casting in as these borderline deviance, um, I don't think that that's, that's what the body of Christ needs right now. All right, let's come back and get our seats. And uh, we, we took a, a break a little bit earlier than we had planned, but um, as I was looking at some of the material we're going through, there's no way there would have been any other place for a break if we needed a break. So we want to start now with, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the uh, Gog-Magog War. Uh, if you've read Joel's books, um, especially the second one, The Mideast Beast, uh, it's pretty, a pretty, pretty key issue there. Um, 
So we'll, we'll start with Tommy. Um, Tommy, just, just tell me about your view of the Gog-Magog war, and uh, I'm sure you know that Joel depends on it a lot, and he's got his own uh, particular uh, view of it. What, what's, what's your response to that? Do you think it's germane? Do you think it in any way uh, supports um, an Islamic uh, antichrist, or w where does the Roman antichrist fit in, if it does at all? So just tell us a little bit about that. Well, I don't think it uh, relates to the antichrist at all. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, it's not an issue uh, in my system. In other words, I wouldn't appeal to it one way or the other uh, for my view. I go to passages that actually talk about uh, the Antichrist. Uh, and Joel says there's only two passages, but there I have five. Uh, I have Daniel chapter 7 that he leaves out. I have Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And these are interrelated to the book of Daniel. Obviously, Daniel 7 is. But as you saw when I went through it, it talks about the, the fourth beast and his image and all of that. And uh, it talks about the little horn, you know, which is clearly the Antichrist in chapter 7. But uh, chapter 13 also is connected with the book of Daniel and picks up to that. Yeah, we're going to get to that later. OK. I but I have uh, 39 <laughs> articles on my website, I think about 2,000 words each, on Gog and Magog. and. Uh, I believe it refers to a uh, Russian-led invasion of it, primarily Islamic countries, probably after the rapture but before the tribulation, but I'm not overly confident in the timing of that. And I think it's totally unrelated to Armageddon. And you look at some of the differences for example, the participants. You have a few nations, it's regional in Gog and Magog, versus all the nations of the world. And you have a number of passages that talk about that in Zechariah, as well as Revelation 16 and others. And then you have the direction of the attack is from the north versus from all the nations of the world. Yes, they do gather in Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley and attack Jerusalem. You have the purpose of the attack is to take spoil and prey, but there's none, no talk like that in the uh, Second Coming or Armageddon. It's to oppose Christ at his return. And so there's no, uh, Ezekiel clearly says the, the human motive, God ultimately is sovereign. He puts hooks in the jaw. He brings Gog and uh, the hordes with him down, but their human motive is to take spoil and pray, but they oppose Christ. They even try to prevent the second coming, I think, at Armageddon. You have different leaders, Gog and Magog, who are not said to be the Antichrist. Now, some Jews think that, but once again, Jews who just look at the Old Testament have a truncated view of the entire plan of God. Armageddon is a term that's used in the New Testament. And I do believe there are Old Testament passages that relate to it, but the name Armageddon, and by the way, I have in our chart book the eight stages of Armageddon. I think it's a very complicated campaign. Uh, that, And so the beast or antichrist and the leader of the world uh, at Armageddon, and you have different disposals of the dead. The dead will be buried makes a big deal out of that in Ezekiel 38, 39, but the dead becomes prey for the birds uh, in Armageddon. And uh, seven months to bury the dead and seven years to burn the instruments. And uh, it's very clear if, if Armageddon and Gog and Magog are the same thing, then you would have to postpone the millennium for seven years while they uh, burn the instruments or whatever, or at least seven months to bury the dead because you're not going to have any of that in the millennium. God's going to clean up planet Earth without help from the EPA or anything like that, and he's going to establish his reign and rule that will not uh, be polluted 
uh, by anything like that. And I think there are other differences. You have in Gog and Magog, you have a series, in fact, in Ezekiel 34, after uh, Ezekiel hears that his wife died, then uh, that's the same time he hears that Jerusalem is uh, taken by the the uh, Babylonians, uh, the book of Ezekiel shifts from judgments on Israel in the present. Now there are some future passages like chapter 20, 22, and some others sprinkled in uh, Ezekiel before verse 30, chapter 34. Then he shifts to the last days. Everything's future. And you have these summary statements about, I think generally in the last days, Israel's going to turn to God. And they're going to know as a result of these things. But you have the phrase in Ezekiel 39 where it says, uh, he, he will no longer turn his back away from Israel. And that goes back to Deuteronomy, uh, I think chapter 32, where he talks about at some point in Israel's history, God's going to turn his back on them. I think that that probably refers to this, these two years, 2,000 years of the diaspora. And, and what that means is, in connection with the regathering of Israel, like in 36 and uh, 35 and 37, he's going to turn his face toward Israel. That's what he says in chapter 39, meaning he's going to deal with the Jewish people. You know, we know from the New Testament that in that interim, uh, as James said in Acts 15, he's going to take out from among the Gentiles the people for his name. Then he's going to return and restore the fallen tabernacle of David. In other words, deal favorably with Israel. So today the church, made up of Jew and Gentile believers, is uh, fulfilling the mission of preaching the gospel and, and as God's representatives. And then during the tribulation, that's the whole point of the 70th week, he's going to start dealing with Israel. And uh, so I think the campaign, the Battle of Gog and Magog, is going to be something that um, takes place probably bef after the rapture, but before the tribulation. And it could be three and a half years, or it could be right at the beginning of the tribulation, but I think it has to be related to the tribulation because during that general time period, God is going to deal with Israel directly again. He's turning his face to them. It's going to, all of these end time events are going to lead to their conversion. And one of the conditions for the second coming, which is related to Armageddon, is that the Jews have to be converted and call on Christ. You see this in Romans 10, for example, where he says, whoever, he quotes from Joel, whoever calls the name of the Lord to be saved or rescued in the context. And he said, Paul asked the question, well, how shall they call on him whom they haven't believed? Yeah, you got a problem. And then how shall they believe in him whom they haven't heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So the outcome is the Jews have to believe and call, and that's what happens in conjunction with the events of Armageddon. Also, you have, uh, in Armageddon, you have them re coming to Jerusalem. And they capture half of the city, according to Zechariah. Uh, at Gog and Magog, they never make it to Jerusalem. They're destroyed on the mountains of Israel, you see. And so I think there's enough significant differences to see these as two separate battles. So I, I would just argue broadly that right before the tribulation, but after the, uh, the rapture, you have a regional attack on Israel, Gog and Magog, and God inter uh, supernaturally intervenes. And then at the end of the tribulation, because of the Antichrist who's trying to destroy Israel so that he can believe that he uh, will disrupt God's plan, you have the, all the armies of the world this time. In other words, you're really going to get those Jews finally in Israel because we're going to have the whole armies of the world and they go and get them. So the first is Gog and Magog, which is regional, and the second coming, or Armageddon, camp, is a campaign there uh, with all the armies of the world, and Satan has his reason in chapter 16, but God has his reason, which overrules 
and he destroys them in the valley of Jehoshaphat. All right, well, thank you. Joe, uh, in um, your book, The Mideast Beast, you've got an uh, extensive section on Gog, Magog. Uh, you find some similarities with uh, Armageddon, and you treat that in a very extensive way. So what, uh, and, and of course, we know that uh, in your position, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is very, very critical. So maybe share why uh, you believe that, Who are the, what are the nations involved? Uh, tell us a little bit about Turkey. I, I think that's part of the picture, so go ahead. Yeah, let me just touch on just the issue of Gog just the, the, the oracle in general. First of all, let me just say this. With regard to the Islamic Antichrist paradigm or theory, when you plug it in to all of the texts, suddenly everything flows together smoothly. So here in Ezekiel, he has this story of this evil end time leader with a massive coalition of nations that invades Israel, that is destroyed. The call goes out to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, come feast on the flesh of kings, mighty warriors, etc., that's actually paraphrased in Revelation 19, which speaks of Armageddon, the return of Jesus. You have the great earthquake that's also in Revelation 16. You have the great hailstones. You have many similarities. So Tommy just spent some time trying to point, on, point out arguments from silence or differences. Um, look, unbelievers do this with the Gospels. Two different accounts. They go, well, look, this account has two angels. This has one. You know, it's a, it's, no, it's not a contradiction. People tell different stories from different perspectives. Ezekiel is simply telling the same story that all of the prophets are telling. Now, the reason that these guys have been forced to say that Gog Magog is different than the Antichrist, it's very simple. The nations are not European. This is what happens when you begin with the false Roman assumption. It causes us to commit really exegetical major errors. It's very clear that Gog is simply Ezekiel's name for the Antichrist. Now let me just quote a few different exegetes who hold to this view. You have John Wesley, C.F. Kyle, German Hebraist, uh, great uh, commentator. John Nelson Darby taught that Gog was the Antichrist. C.I. Schofield, Arthur Pink, E.W. Bullinger, G.H. Lang, one of my favorite uh, commentators whose book was uh, endorsed by F.F. F. Bruce, one of the most legendary scholars, biblical scholars of last century. Uh, Walter Theodore Zimmerly, kind of a liberal, but wrote probably the most technical commentary on Ezekiel that's out there. H.A. Uh, Ironside, Finnis Jennings Dake, he's kind of an unusual character. Charles Lee Feinberg, the great uh, messianic dispensationalist. Charles Ryrie taught that Gog is the Antichrist. Dave Hunt, Sver Bu, he's a Norwegian theologian who wrote this incredible um, monograph on Gog Magog, G.K. Beale, one of the best, he's, he's an amillennialist, but a fantastic commentary um, on Revelation. So listen, I just want to make it clear, this is not an unusual view. There are many highly qualified scholars that hold the same position that I do. Now let's look at some of the scriptures and the reasons why Gog is the Antichrist. Now Tommy said, well, they die on the mountains and they're wiped out right away. The mountains of Israel is an idiom. It's an expression used to refer to all of Israel. It's not saying they all die on the mountains. Like these armies invade and none of them die except on the mountains. That's not what it's saying. Listen, Ezekiel 36, verse 1 through 3. Son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, to the valleys, to the desolate wastes, to the deserted cities. It's all of Israel. The mountains of Israel is a Hebrew idiom. It doesn't just mean on the mountains of Israel. Second, they are not destroyed as soon as they enter, as we'll see. Now, what are some of the events that the text says that Tommy did not discuss? Events that will happen as a specific result of Gog and his hordes being destroyed. What does the text say? Well, it says in, as Tommy quoted, chapter 39, verse 7. I'm going to skip forward to the latter part here. The Lord says, and this is as a direct result of Gog and his hordes being destroyed. The Lord says, my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. So Tommy says this event happens back sometime around the middle of the tribulation. Now what does the Antichrist do? He blasphemes the name of God for three and a half years, and he raises up a global movement that does likewise 
right? So how can it be said back, if Tommy's position is correct, back in the middle of the seven years? How can it be said that God will no longer allow his name to be profaned just before the greatest movement of blasphemy that the earth has ever seen is about to sweep the earth? That doesn't make sense. The only way that verse makes sense is if you place it at the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns. No one's blaspheming Jesus' name after that. What else do we have? Well, within the text, chapter 39, 6 through 7, the Lord says, I will send fire on Magog and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Wait a minute. So how is it that the people that dwell in the coastlands will all know the Lord three and a half years before the return of Jesus? That doesn't make any sense. And the nations, the Gentiles, shall know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. That doesn't happen until Jesus returns. What else? It says Israel will come to know God forevermore. Uh, chapter 39, verse 22. So the house of Israel shall know that I am Yahweh, their God, from that day forward. Does all of Israel get saved three and a half years before the return of Jesus? No. Zechariah 12 makes it very clear. They will look upon the one they have pierced when he returns in the clouds. And they'll weep and mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son, etc., etc., right? And he, he says, I will pour out my spirit of grace and supplication on them. They'll weep. They'll repent. All Israel finally comes to the Lord when he returns and they look upon him. This is exactly what's being described here as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his hordes. Uh, verse 26 and 28, Israel shall forget their shame and the treachery uh, that they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid. And I will not leave any of them remaining among the nations anymore. So pay attention to this because the chapter ends with Israel being delivered from the nations, no more remaining captives or exiles among the nations. That's at the end of the prophecy, right? Uh, Verse 29, the Lord, this is Tommy referenced, I will not hide my face from them anymore when I pour out my spirit on Israel, declares the Lord God, the whole house of Israel. Listen, that doesn't happen until Jesus returns. If you say that Gog is someone other than the Antichrist, you end up with a chaotic position that doesn't work with the text. This is what happens when you impose, you come with the false Roman assumption Instead of looking at what's clearly there in the text, you're forced to go, well, you make all these arguments from silence. You know, well, it doesn't say anything about coming for spoils. Well, it doesn't say anything about coming for spoils in Zechariah 12 or 14 or Joel. But those are all talking about the Antichrist. You can't make arguments from silence. Uh, beyond that, the Messiah is present. Chapter 38, 19 through 20. In my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Just like what happens when he returns. Revelation 16, the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the ground, chihuahuas and such, all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. Now that word, panim, in the Hebrew, it's my face. This is not just my glory. This is not, you know, my name, my renown, my fame, my face. Jacob wrestled with God. He said, I've seen God face to face. It's the same word. The Septuagint translates it as prosopone. It means presence. They will tremble at my presence. Why? Because he's in the land of Israel. And then we've read this one already. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. The nations will know that what? I'm the holy one of Israel? No, that's a very common phrase used throughout the Old Testament. The only time this specific phrase is ever used is right here. I am the holy one in Israel. Ezekiel is talking about the parousia. It's talking about the return of Jesus. Then it says that Gog's defeat concludes when? At the day of the Lord. Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Behold, it is coming and it will be brought about, declares the Lord. This is the day that I have spoken of. Who is the, what is the day that the Lord is speaking of? He's speaking of the day of the Lord. All of the prophets are speaking of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the primary focus of all of the biblical prophets. Ezekiel is simply telling the same story that all of the other prophets are speaking of. And then God comes right out and he says, Gog, you're the guy. 
You're the Antichrist. He basically says that. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Are you not the one I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. Now, if Ezekiel is not talking about the Antichrist, then it is Tommy's responsibility to tell us and show us and point to us all of the prophecies in the prophets that came before Ezekiel that are talking about this Russian invasion. But he can't point to one. He can point to many passages that speak of the Antichrist because they're all telling the same story. So if Tommy would like to maintain his position that this is not speaking of the Antichrist, he has to be able to do so biblically. And so I extend the challenge and turn it over to Tommy. I wanted to uh, raise a question that actually Tommy had mentioned in his opening. Um, what about the seven years of burning the implements of war? How does that, we're going to have a, a millennial uh, period of time when there's all this pollution and burning. I know that was a, a Look, thing. the prophets say you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will restore, you know, look, there is a very real literal restoration of the earth. The Lord returns with a sword, not a magic wand. He doesn't just, you know, there's a rainbow wave, doesn't just sweep over the earth and all things are just fresh and new. There is a very real, literal rebuilding of the earth that the peoples of the earth will participate with the Lord in. And so there's, I don't understand why there's a problem with having fires and burning stuff. They're burning weapons. That's pretty much an identical statement to, and they will beat their swords into plowshares. They will convert weapons of war into tools for agricultural and fuel or whatever else. There's no problem with that. It's, it's creating a problem where none exists. Okay, thank you. Tommy, I want to... Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, the other passages, as I was saying, in Ezekiel talk generally about uh, the Lord, you know, the, the, them learning and knowing that he is God at, at each one of those, uh, you know, 36, 37, et cetera, and all that. I think that's a general uh, statement there. Secondly, even if he's right about the timing of God being related to Magog, he hasn't shown that it's Islamic Antichrist. None of that... Uh, actually is actual evidence he's just shown because uh, I guarantee you the all those people he quoted dispensationalists none of them believe that the uh, Antichrist was to be Islamic secondly or thirdly Ryrie does not take a view in his thing he suggests different views uh, I've discussed this with him and uh, you said my motive for coming up with my view was to avoid um, an Islamic Antichrist view. Hey, I came to these views before I ever heard of the Islamic Antichrist view. I never had in my mind any idea about avoiding anything other than just studying the text. So, uh, you know, you were wrong on guessing about the motive for a person having that view. Yeah, no, I didn't say that's your motive. I just mean that's this is what it forces you to do. Well, as I say, I came up with this view before the Islamic Antichrist view was there, so it didn't, uh, uh, that was a statement about why we didn't want, you said something about this is why we avoid such a view. No, it, we're just trying to coordinate scripture, the details of scripture, you know, at that point. And uh, these are not arguments from silence. These are actual statements in the biblical text that I pointed out that differ from one another. That's not silence. And I, I agree, uh, sometimes, like in the synoptic gospels, you have some details in the others, but the narratives do not have contradictions in them, you see? So I would argue that those are contradictions because you have uh, the birds eating the flesh clearly at Armageddon, but you don't have that. You have them being buried for seven months. The birds are not eating uh, the flesh the and call so goes out. the call goes out eat come eat the flesh pardon it says right in Ezekiel the call goes out to the birds of the air the beasts of the field come feast on the flesh of kings and so forth right but it still takes them seven months to bury it and uh, seven years to burn the implements and you wouldn't do that you're not going to do that in the millennium because there's going to be topographical changes in Israel and Jerusalem it's very clear in uh, Zechariah but you still haven't demonstrated that this supports the notion of an Islamic Antichrist, even if we take your view on 
Gog and Magog. Well, that's what I wanted to back up to. Because, um, yeah, how does you, Ezekiel 38 and 39 actually, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but I want you to make it clear. Sure. So, no, it's very simple. Um, there's two points. One, Gog is clearly the Antichrist. And again, notice that Tommy didn't even try to point out any passage in the pre-Ezekiel prophets where God is talking about his Russian invasion. God says it. You're the guy. Aren't you the guy? There's no reference to a Russian invasion. He can't do it. It doesn't exist. I think that those are general references to uh, end time issues, not a specific reference to uh, the Gog passage anywhere else, because I don't know anyone that thinks another passage refers to Gog and Magog specifically. Yeah, I think well, maybe Whit Kong, one of those guys, says the king of the north or something, but for the most part, I agree with you, yeah. But he's not pre-Ezekiel. Um, this is a problem. This is a problem. You know, when you look at all of these events, they force the passage to conclude at the day of the Lord, at the return of Jesus. So either you have the Antichrist and Gog both being destroyed, you have all of these similarities, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, the great hailstones, the great earthquakes, you have all of those things. Um, the next point is this, is that when you look at the names, these are Middle Eastern nations. Now, Tommy will say it's a Russian-led Middle Eastern invasion and North African invasion, so the inference is very clear. If this is the Antichrist, again, which the text demands, and God says, you're the guy that all the other prophets are talking about, um, then it's very clear that the nations are Middle Eastern nations. And this idea that Magog, or the word Rosh, points to Russia, has absolutely nothing to stand on. I've worked through all of Tommy's articles very carefully. Um, Mark Hitchcock just walked in, another fantastic exegete. I've worked through all of his stuff. They'll quote various guys selectively. They'll sort of data pick and you know, cherry pick through the data, quoting guys like Clyde Billington and so forth. There is no solid scholarly basis to say that this is talking about Russia. Instead, it points to a Turkish-led Middle Eastern North African invasion. And so this is a big issue. This is a big issue. And I'm not alone in this position. This is the position that has been held from the earliest days. The idea that it was talking about Russia, this is a new view. You know, the, you can go do a historical survey of all of the commentators down through history uh, up until roughly around the time of Matthew Henry. They were pointing to Turkey. And after that, people started sort of weighing the option of Russia. But we can get into that some more. To respond to that, he said that there was absolutely no uh, nothing. First of all, uh, Everybody follows um, Jerome, uh, the Vulgate, on this, on the Rosh, meaning of Rosh. And Jerome said the reason he left, he did not uh, believe that it referred to Russia, that's in the, the 390s, is because they weren't in the Table of Nations. Well, uh, a guy named uh, Price, not Randy Price, uh, has James Price has done a, he, first of all, he has a PhD from Dropsy. It's like seven years to get your PhD in Hebrew from Dropsy. I mean, it is the most rigorous uh, Hebrew program there is. And he did a word study showing that what everybody pretty much believes, that the grammar is a, is a proper noun. And uh, Jerome did not make his decision based on grammar because it's a Hebrew construct there. Uh, instead, he made it based on his opinion of the lack of uh, that being in the Table of Nations. And uh, he, uh, Price went through and studied all this and says it has to be uh, grammatically, pure grammar, a proper name. And then a guy named Billington wrote his doctoral dissertation showing that Yamaachi, who is the guy everybody quotes, uh, says that the Rosh people, uh, you know, are not related to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And he wrote a whole dissertation showing that Yamaachi was wrong. Yamaachi says they came from Finland or somewhere. But he shows that, first of all, Rosh, when you uh, put it through its different uh, uh, languages, it clearly did refer in is it 11-2 or 10, uh, Genesis 11-2 to a na uh, nation in the nation? And it does, he traces this and shows that it does refer to Russia. So 
The scholars that he's referring to are more recent scholars, like Daniel Block, who hates dispensationalism. In fact, I heard him give a lecture once on why uh, uh, Ezekiel 28 does not refer to Satan, why Gog and Magog is not going to happen, why there's not going to be a millennial temple, uh, why there's not going to be a regathering of Israel. I talked to him afterwards. You mean the, the modern state of Israel is not a regathering of Israel? No, it's not. You know, it's just not biblical. I mean, and that is typical of what is called evangelical scholarship today. These guys are all moving toward liberal views when it comes to philology or, or study of words and all of this because they want to make all the liberals happy. But I can tell you all kinds of Hebrew scholars that uh, believe that Rosh does refer to Russia, including Gesenius, who was the greatest grammarian in the 1800s, and his Latin version has a whole page on this. And, uh, you know, you, you quoted Kyle earlier. He believed it referred to Russia, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, there is a strong basis for this. And before uh, this, before, see, futurism was the view of the early church. And then it was wiped out, you know, with the Roman Catholic eschatology. And you had historicism arise in the Middle Ages. And when Protestants revived premillennialism in the 1600s, they were historicist, meaning they didn't take things literally. And they all believed that, that Gog and Magog referred to uh, Islam, not based on phil philological or word studies or anything like that. Futurism wasn't revived in the English-speaking world till the early 1800s. And in the United States, it really didn't catch on till after the Civil War. And as a result, you've had a whole rethinking of things like uh, Gog and Magog uh, within a futurist, literal, interpretive approach. And that's why uh, pretty much most people think that uh, Gog and Magog is a separate battle within the futurist camp. Not everybody, but, and that's why you have some of the early dispensationalists who were still hanging on to historicist views. The idea that the, the, the Pope is the Antichrist is a hangover from historicism, you see. And the idea that, uh, that Babylon is Rome is a historicist view that was widespread. Babylon means Babylon get into Revelation, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond to his comments about Rosh. Okay. So let me do this real quick. Um, there are two methods. Let me try to explain this. There are two methods that interpreters use to identify the names, to understand what the names mean. The first one that is used by many irresponsible exegetes, it's kind of this bloodline, lineage, historical wild goose chase. They're trying to trace them down. They migrated up the Volga River Valley, intermarried here, and they're trying to align them with peoples today genetically, right? And I, I, you know, a lot of folks have done that. Uh, the more proper way is to identify where were these names in Ezekiel's day. Now, unfortunately, what Dr. Ice does is he interprets all of the names Tubal, Meshach, Gomer, Tagorma, Put, Lud, and Persia through the proper lens, correctly, and he's actually the most consistent of all the guys out there. But then when he gets to Magog and Rosh, he switches methods. So, and he actually what he does with Rosh is he takes a shotgun approach. He tries to throw out anything that'll stick against the wall, nothing works, and then he says, clearly I've proven it. And I go, you haven't proven anything. So this is a quote from Tommy. He says that Rosh, is actually the Tiras peoples. He doesn't say, he says most likely. It is very likely that the name Rosh is actually derived from the name Tiras in Genesis 10. So, i.e., we are to look for the Tiras, the Therations. Where were they in Ezekiel's day? If, if this is most likely, well, here's a map. They were in Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania. That's not Russia. So first his effort to say that Rosh is Tiras, the Therations. Here's another map you can see right on that edge of the Black Sea, um, it doesn't work. They were still actually in Turkey, T T Tiras, if it's, that's Rosh. Then he tries this other one. He says, clearly. Now, whenever someone says clearly, obviously, be careful. Let them demonstrate it. Don't be swayed by clearly, or everyone believes. We all believe. All the 
cool kids think this. Clearly, Rosh or Tiras was a well-known place in Ezekiel's day in the 6th century BC, the time Ezekiel wrote his prophecy. And then look, he says, several bands of Rosh people lived in an area to the north of the Black Sea. Several bands lived. So look, let's say that there was a prophecy today about the United States. And I look at it and I go, well, this is clearly talking about China. There's over 200,000 Americans in China. No. The prophecy is talking about America. It's not talking about because a few bands lived up here or there. Now look at Billington. These are the, this is the guy that they all quote. Billington says, there are scholars who do associate Rosh, Meshach, Tubal with Asia Minor. That's Turkey. And certainly all three peoples were there in Ezekiel's day. Okay, so if they were there in Ezekiel's day, why don't they ever quote this quote in their books? No, they go, well, Billington demonstrates that there were several bands of people in Ezekiel's day that lived north of the Black Sea. So what? That's your basis for saying that there's a coming Russian invasion of Israel? It doesn't work. So he tries that method. Then he goes to this one. This is sort of the final one. These ones didn't quite stick, and he goes here. The ancient Rosh people, who have been traced back to Tiras, a son of Japheth, who migrated to the Caucasus Mountains in southern Russia are one of the genetic sources of the modern. Who cares who the genetic sources are? That's not the responsible method of interpretation. We don't care about bloodline. We care about where were these peoples. And when you have these three names, Misha, even if Rosh was a proper name, I don't, I, this, is a, this is argued among Hebrew scholars much better than either Tommy or I, but even if it is, Look, the phrase is Gog of Magog, chief prince. Let's just say it's Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. Tommy agrees that Meshach and Tubal is Turkey. So how does it work? Chief prince of Russia, Turkey, and Turkey? That's like saying you, Obama, chief prince of Washington, Moscow, Beijing. That doesn't make any sense. If it's Rosh, and these are tribes that were all in Asia Minor, then it makes clear sense. Once again, the Islamic... Uh, interpretation. It's simple. It's easy to understand. I'm like a guy that just came and I said, look, the magicians try to do this thing where they switch methods. You don't realize they just, they're doing a card trick. Because, you, you know, you, these scholars, these guys, you don't understand. They just throw out all these things and then they say, clearly, this is that. No. I've just, I've just revealed the magic. Take the magic away. The peoples were in Asia Minor in Ezekiel's day. That's where the overwhelming consensus of scholars that don't have some prophetic bone to pick. That's where they all will put them. And so, you know, this whole Russian thing, I understand it sells books, but it's, it's simply not biblically supportable. Yeah, you, you think Daniel Block doesn't have a bone to pick? Uh, he does. Uh, I've got to finish this. We'll give you a minute. And uh, my point is, is the objections is, is that it's a, it's a uh, pronoun, not a proper noun. And I was an dealing with that, that the grammar has to re said, refer. Even if Rosh is a name, I allowed for it. I said, okay, even if it fine, is, you still fine, But in statement. other uh, statements, you made a big deal out of that. Uh, that one on Southwest Radio Church and stuff, you made a big deal out of that. Okay. Secondly, uh, I agree with the idea that it's where they were when they were there. I say that in my articles. If, right. you, read them, if you read them all, I don't take the bloodline view at all. And thirdly, uh, we're answering Jer uh, Jerome's objection to changing it, not based on the grammar from a uh, proper noun to a pronoun, and showing and answering Yamahachi, who they all quote, that they came from uh, Norway, showing that there were people there, not everybody. And fourthly, it says they come from the uttermost parts of the north. Right. And that's where Russia is. That's an adjectival statement that further identifies who Rosh is. Which it says the exact same phrase, the uttermost parts of the north of Beth Tagorma. And Tommy says Beth Tagorma was in Turkey. This is the big argument. The uttermost parts of the north, that can't be Turkey. It says the exact same statement of Beth Tagorma. Any translation, open your Bible right now. Beth Tagorma from the uttermost parts of the north. And then you look at Tommy's identification. He says clearly they were in Turkey. So that argument is, is nonsense. All right, well, let's go on to uh, Revelation chapter 13. Uh, certainly a key issue in any discussion of the Antichrist. I want to read the first three verses. 
Uh, Revelation 13, uh, verse 1, 2, and 3, we read these words, if you have a Bible open to it. Um, Revelation 13, 1, it says this, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and a seat and great authority. Now this is the verse that I want to ask uh, Dr. Ice about. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So as we look at um, verse... 13, uh, verse 3 of chapter 13, what uh, do you believe the reference is to a rebirth? What nation, what area has been uh, reborn? Well, before I answer that, I want to deal with the passage. And what you have in chapter 13, it obviously follows chapter 12. In Revelation 12, that's the story of Israel and the beast being, uh, the dragon being kicked out of heaven. And 13.1 is a continuation of what was being talked about, the struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, which is dealing with history in the past, but also prophecy in the future, and its focus is on the future tribulation. That's why 13.1 says he, who's the he referring to? Back to the dragon uh, in verse 17. And he stood on the sand of the seashore. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So this is the dragon, which is Satan. And here's the beast, which is a human being, coming up out of the sea. So this is dealing with who the Antichrist is here. And uh, the sea, as we're going to find out in Revelation 17, represents the Gentile masses of humanity. This imagery is also used in uh, Daniel 7 as well. And the winds blow on them and influence uh, events in history because the, the nations can get stirred up. And it, just like the sea, when you have hurricanes and things, it's very dangerous. So it is the Gentile masses of humanity. Uh, and he has ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems. Once again, this comes from Daniel chapter 7 which uh, Joel says does not uh, says it's not an important passage relating to the Antichrist. Well, it certainly is, and it, it's reiterated here. But this single beast, which is the revived Roman beast, uh, has a composite from the three previous kingdoms, uh, so that he has, well, the seven heads, uh, I believe, re represent, as we'll see in chapter 17, it represents the uh, seven nations that have persecuted Israel. And that's important in this context because that's what he's been talking about in chapter 12, is the beast persecuting the woman, uh, which is Israel. And uh, on his horns were ten diadems. That is the form based on Daniel of the ten-nation confederacy that is being talked about at this present time. And on his head were blasphemous names. And... It says, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a lion, or a bear rather, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And those are the, the composite from Daniel 7 into this single beast who is the fourth beast. He's from the fourth empire revived. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, I don't have 13.3 uh, there, so let me get my Bible. And of course, that's dealing with the beast who was killed and revived. And once again, Revelation 17 explains this, if you don't understand it here in chapter 13, what this is talking about. And so it says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Now, this is talking about the Antichrist who's killed in the middle of the tribulation. 
four times in the book of Revelation, it says that this refers to the beast who was slain but was healed. The same exact term of the lamb, which is a reference to Israel, I mean to Jesus, is spoken of as being killed and resurrected, of course. But the ver- it uses the very same language. So I think this is actually going to happen. Satan cannot raise the dead, but I believe God is going to do it. And you have evidence of that in Second Thessalonians 2, where it says that God will send them strong delusions. To who? Not people during the church age who didn't believe, but people in the tribulation who are called the earth dwellers in the book of Revelation through false signs, wonders, and uh, so that they will believe a lie. And you have this reiterated in chapter 13 as the miracles of same language, false signs, etc., that the false prophet does on behalf of the enemy. So I think God temporarily gives them the ability of him to be raised from the dead in the second half of the tribulation, and that's when he, he goes global. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Now, this term amazed was used by John in his gospel about how the people were amazed about Jesus. And so you have a similar type of amazement by the unbelievers who are known in Revelation as the earth dwellers. And uh, therefore, that's what I think. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? Well, we find out who is able to wage war. Jesus comes at the second coming and just goes, and blows them away with the least effort that our sovereign God can exert. He deals with this huge complex of billions of people in in a moment of time. And this is further explained in chapter 17. You want me to go? Can I go there? Go ahead. Uh, And we see in 17.8 it says, And those who dwell on the earth, once again the earth dwellers, Uh, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. In other words, they're not elect. That's why they continue to not believe. In Revelation 3.10, the first use of earth dwellers, it says that God is testing. One of the purposes of tribulation is to test those who dwell upon the earth. And no matter what they go through, the entire events of the tribulation, an unbeliever is an unbeliever is an unbeliever. And it says when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. So here, once again, he's talking about the Antichrist. Uh, And this is further explained here in 17.9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The very same phrase that's used in Revelation 13 of the mark of the beast. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, I don't think this refers to Rome or Jerusalem or anything. It says, and they are seven kings. Now, come on. This doesn't refer to Rome. It's seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. So... Who are these seven kings? They are leaders of the kingdoms. In other words, mountains. It's used that way in the book of Daniel as well. That have persecuted Israel throughout history. That is derived from Revelation 12. Because it mentions the ten kingdoms, the seven uh, kings and all of this. The very same phrase back in Revelation 12. Five have fallen. So number one is Egypt, who enslaved the Jewish people. Number two is Assyria, that enslaved the northern kingdom. Number three is Babylon, uh, that destroyed the temple and enslaved Judah. By the way, I think this is the reference to the Assyrian. It's an idiomatic statement. In other words, the Assyrians are pictured in the Bible as the meanest, cruelest people. They invented crucifixion and all of this kind of stuff. Revelation 17. Okay. I want to back up to Revelation 13. Well, I don't want 13. to stop in the middle. Let me finish this. 
Okay, he can but have it's far, far beyond what we were asking, and I wanted to give well, Joel an opportunity for Revelation 13.3, but go ahead. I understand, but he, I, I need to, I'm right in the middle. I would have to go back and start over. Babylon destroyed uh, the temple and enslaved Judah. Medo-Persia, the anti-Semitism of Esther. Greece, Hellenization under Antiochus Epiphanes. One is, which has to be Rome. The 70, AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The other has not yet come, it says. So it's identifying Rome, I think, clearly as the one who is when the book of Revelation was written. And the other has not yet come, so that's the revived Roman Empire guy. And so that is what he's talking about. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and goes to destruction. So who's this? He's also the seventh and the eighth. Well, that refers to the, uh, the uh, Antichrist after he's killed at the midpoint of the tribulation, where I think speculation that Satan indwells him after he's resurrected. He's the seventh and the eighth because he's the same person here. And the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings which have not yet received a kingdom. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. So that's the ten nation confederacy that we see in the book of Daniel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's get back to Revelation 13.3. I want to ask Joel actually two questions now that come to mind. First of all, uh, in Revelation 13, 3, what empire experiences a rebirth? That's, that's what we were dealing with a few minutes ago. And then um, I think also, um, Joel, is there any significance in the makeup of the beast, the body of a leopard, Greece, the mouth of a lion, Babylon, the feet of a bear, Medo-Persia? So if you could address those two issues. Right. So, um, no, it's fine that Tommy covered that because he was essentially just saying everything that I agree with except for the last part. Um, Tommy and I are in agreement. There's really only two interpretations. The, you know, the amillennialists, the preterists, they say these seven kings are seven historical Roman emperors. Uh, and then G.K. Beale in his commentary on Revelation makes a chart because even though these guys say they're all these Roman emperors, but none of them can agree as to which ones. You know, they're like, we know it must be true. We just have no idea what or whatever. And uh, it's clearly, I agree with Tommy, we're dealing with seven historical persecuting anti-Christ, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist empires. This beast arises before the dragon, before Satan. Satan's primary method of uh, accomplishing his purposes in the earth has always been through pagan empires. And so I agree with Tommy. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Persia, Greece, Rome was the sixth. That was the one that is. So we're in full agreement there. The difference is, and again, Tommy just articulated it. He says he believes that the eighth is the Antichrist after the middle uh, of the tribulation. So here's Tommy's uh, schema sort of chart. Again, you know, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Now Tommy says the Antichrist is the seventh and the eighth. But notice that Tommy believes that Rome is the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. Okay, so his position is that Rome was the sixth. That's the one that was, because the prophecy says five have been, one is. And then it just refers to one. The other has yet to come. And then he throws in this cryptic riddle, but the seventh, uh, uh, the eighth is of the seventh, and he's going to come back. Now listen, in Dan and by the way, Tommy, I didn't say <laughs> that Daniel 7 has nothing to do with the Antichrist. I simply, group no, I simply grouped it together with Daniel 2. I said they're both saying the same thing. You said there are only two uh, possible Roman Empire chapters, Daniel 2.40 and Daniel 9.26, from that video you made with Southwest Radio Church. Okay, well, if I said that, I misspoke. Of course I believe that Daniel chapter 7 is an okay. Antichrist passage. Um, but here's the thing, is that when we look at this passage, it has to flow with the previous revelations. It has to flow with Daniel 2. It has to flow with Daniel 7, right? It's not going to clash with them. Now, I suggested that the legs of iron represents the Islamic empire. The feet represent the last day's manifestation, the revival of that empire. Tommy says that it's the Roman empire that will be revived in the last days. The problem is when Tommy gets to Revelation 17, he has a three-phased empire. 
Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 both reveal one empire that has two phases. Daniel 2 has the legs of iron, out of which come the feet of iron and clay. Daniel 7 has the fourth beast. Daniel 7 verse 24, out of which come ten horns, rise up out of the beast. One empire, two manifestations. One empire, two phases. The historical and the last days. When Tommy gets to Revelation 17, because he has that previous Roman assumption, it, it forces him to take the view that Rome is the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. Now, notice what it does. It forces him to take an inconsistent method of interpretation. He begins with Egypt, and then it's a new king, new kingdom. He goes to Assyria. He goes from Assyria, a new kingdom, a new kingdom, all the way up until the very end. And then he says, well, the eighth, that's the last three and a half years of the Antichrist. So what? Why would that be a new head? Why wouldn't it just be the seventh head? So not only does he have a three-phased kingdom, as opposed to a two-phased kingdom, which was what is already previously established by the texts, but he has no basis to have a set, an eighth head. There's no, just, who cares if the Antichrist is possessed by Satan? It's the same guy, it's the same kingdom. Every head, he goes different king, different kingdom, and he moves all the way up. Now, I understand the idea of going from the seventh to the eighth, because yes, it's a revival of the historical empire. I understand that, and that's why it's kind of a cryptic riddle. But that doesn't make sense. The position that I offer is that Rome was the one that is, and he goes, and after you is coming another one. There is another empire that emerged in history that carried all of the same traits as all of the previous empires. In fact, it is the greatest manifestation of anti-Christic, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist spirit that we have ever seen. In fact, those very doctrines are written in the very holy book of the Quran. Now, yes, that's just circumstantial evidence, that's newspaper exegesis, but at a certain point, we need to kind of get past our paranoia of newspaper exegesis. I mean, open your eyes. It's right in front of us. They've surrounded the throne of David. And to say, well, that's irrelevant. You know, in, um, in the d interview with Brian Call, Tommy says, that's ridiculous. Islam comes after the Bible. How could the Bible ever be talking about Islam? Prophecy. The Bible has prophecy in it. It actually saw a head. And so I would just suggest that the idea that the seventh head is simply... The historical Islamic empire, it flows with Daniel 2 and 7, as I've suggested. It doesn't require me to take an inconsistent method of interpretation. It flows smoothly. It makes sense. Revelation 17 is a pan-historical picture. It includes all of the persecuting uh, antichrist empires. You go, well, wait a minute. Why was it not included in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? Because the context of Daniel 2 was the series of kingdoms that would crush Babylon Medo-Persia and Greece. And the, and the Lord chose to leave Rome out. He, he jumped literally from, uh, from Medo-Persia right to the final empire. And now Tommy would say, you know, that's ridiculous. You can't have a gap. Tommy has a gap between the feet, between the legs and the feet, a 1,500-year gap between the historical empire and the revival. Everyone has a gap. So, you know, any of the, any of the oppositions, uh, any of the challenges to that view actually get turned back on the Roman Empire. Again, the Islamic position makes sense. It's actually far more simple, and it, and it gives us quite a bit of potential insight into what we see unfolding in the earth right now. So that, okay. Uh, the text says there's also an eighth. The uh, seventh, the sixth kingdom is the sixth kingdom out of which uh, this context is beast comes. And so it talks about the seventh, which is the Antichrist. And then you, you know, look at the text. It says there is also an eighth. I didn't make that up because of some Roman prejudice. It's there in the text. But what, is, what is the eighth? Else? Pardon? Well, I mean, Where's the eighth in Daniel 2? Where's the third phase? It's not. This is progressive revelation. He comes okay. in and expands on it and adds to it. it. It's very clear that he was speaking of the Roman Empire. But why do you switch uh, it As the sixth kingdom. And in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, he kept looking at the uh, second phase of the Roman Empire. We call the revived Roman Empire because it had different qualities to it. Rome was iron. 
the uh, one at the time of Christ. And then it morphed the feet, which includes the shins, technically in Hebrew, uh, and uh, morphs into iron and clay. That is representative of the second phase of the Roman Empire. This passage then comes and talks about the beast who's associated with Rome, but it's the revived Roman Empire, and therefore there's two phases of the beast. That's added here in this passage only. Daniel 7, 24 says the ten horns come up out of the beast. Now that's the kingdom of the Antichrist. Right. But you're saying there's another phase after that. No, I'm saying the beast career, not the ten nation confederacy. Uh, the ten nation confederacy is the ten nation confederacy. And the little horn comes up among them, according to Daniel. And then you have added revelation starting in chapter 13, and then it's expanded. And, and this is an explanatory section here in 1711 and all of this. It's not new symbols being introduced. But for what reason, what basis do you have to say that the eighth is a new kingdom when it's not a new kingdom? I didn't say it's it was same. a new kingdom. You said I said that. I'm well, talking about the Antichrist, who is part of the seventh kingdom. But every head is a new kingdom. No, not every head is a new kingdom. We're talking about Up until seven. The, the Antichrist. It uses the beast both, uh, depending on the context, of the kingdom itself, and then sometimes of the person. Clearly, in chapter 13, he's talking about the person, because then he talks about the second beast, who's the false prophet. He's identified in chapter 19 as a false prophet. He's thrown away. And then you have an ex expansion of this, and uh, he adds revelation, and that is understood if you understand chapter 13, where the beast is killed. Well, now, and for clarity, because I didn't say this, I believe that the Antichrist, the personal Antichrist, will likely suffer the fatal head wound. Right. But I think that there is plenty of room for debate as to whether or not that's emphasizing the kingdom being revived or the individual, because it's, you know, mountains, kingdoms, kings. It's very difficult to differentiate when you sort of have that, what is it focusing on? And is it simply focusing on the revival of this seventh empire? Yes. And, and to me, that you, just simply makes a lot more sense. But you deny that Rome is the sixth empire. No, I say Rome is the sixth empire. Rome is, this is my chart right there. I don't know if you can see then, it. Then the Antichrist kingdom in the tribulation is a revival of the Roman Empire, not... No, the seventh is the Islamic Empire. It's the one that comes after Rome, and then it is revived. It's the historical Islamic Empire that is revived in the last days as the Antichrist. I don't have a third phase because there is no third phase. Well, the Islamic Empire does not need to be revived. It's still in existence. In 1923, the caliphate was abolished. The office of the caliph was ended. That would be like ending the office of the pope, breaking up the empire. This empire, which existed for 1,400 years, controlled the Middle East. But it's it, like you just come along, you know, you're reading all of this stuff, and then you just add that from outside the Bible. I, I, by the way, uh, the Bible does not talk about Islam just as the Bible doesn't talk about Catholicism. It speaks of many nations that are currently Islamic, but it doesn't speak of Islam in a descriptive way. I understand what you're saying, but I yeah. think it describes that which we are seeing and will see in the last days so that we can discern it when we see yeah, it. Yeah, and I understand that, but uh, to me, uh, you're just bringing ideas probably influenced by contemporary events that uh, I don't know. I think I've made a, just I think I've, I think I've made a pretty solid scriptural case. I don't think I've brought in any current events up until this point. Well, I know, but I, I don't see any uh, compulsion. You haven't presented actual arguments for an Islamic antichrist, other than perhaps uh, the um, Syrian, which I think right. is is so far what we've emphasized is a Middle Eastern empire. As now, let me just say this, by the way, I've come here and I've laid it all on the line. I presented what I believe in Middle Eastern Islamic, and I'm just in the position of defending my position. Tommy hasn't really said what he believes. Roman is a fairly general thing. He didn't, he doesn't talk about the religion of the Antichrist and this sort of thing, right? So, you know, in a debate, it's much more difficult to defend a position. Um, I don't really even know what he believes about the religion of the Antichrist. I don't even know if you have an opinion. Most people just take a vague view, which therefore you don't have to defend anything. Um, you know, so for, for all clarity, yes, I do think the Antichrist will be Islamic, but up until now, all we've demonstrated is that he comes from the Middle East and not uh, 
Europe. And yeah, if you want to say the whole Middle East is about to, as Tommy says, get wiped out, or they're all going to, you know, Oprah's going to send out the email and they're all just going to convert to New Age overnight. Yeah, okay, if you think that's going to happen, maybe. You could say, well, he could still come from the Middle East and be a whatever. But I think so far what we've dealt with, is, dealt with is the region from which he's coming. I didn't say Islam would be wiped out. I said that it would no longer be the global factor that it is. And, uh, you know, you said you read my stuff. I have over 600 articles. I've written articles on that stuff. And sorry if you haven't read them. I haven't read them all. <laughs> About um, a revived Islamic caliphate, um, what is the historical... Uh, empire that disappears. You're talking about the Ottoman Empire that lost its power and yeah. that that is... Yeah, essentially if, what if, I'm saying is after Muhammad died, there were a series of caliphates. Just call right. that an empire. It's an Islamic government. The caliph is the military, religious, political, all wrapped into one. Pope, president, and general. You had the Rashidun, the Abbasid, the Umayyad, and then the Ottoman. Just think of these as dynasties. And they had different capitals that moved around from Iraq to Syria up to Constantinople, became Istanbul. But that together, these make up the historical caliphate, the government of Islam that controlled the Middle East. That it, it clearly follows after the pattern of all of these previous empires, not only in geography, but also in spirit. And then it was abolished in 1923 when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk abolished the caliphate. The office of the caliph was beheaded. Today we are seeing the early phases of the revival. Will it be specifically Turkey or will it be more Syria, Iraq? I try not to be overly specific. I lean toward Turkey. I admit that's, you know, it, it, may, it may be more Syria, Iraq, but it's, the scriptures are repeatedly pointing to that part of the world. Okay, let, let me... Uh, uh, throw a question in I think that a lot of people um, are probably thinking about and I know I've had several people ask me about that uh, we certainly don't want to be guilty of newspaper exegesis however I think maybe you mentioned it before uh, if we are right whatever our eschatological view is we're going to see some kind of confirmation I mean we're not just cut off from current events so first of all um, uh, Tommy, when we look, uh, for example, at some of the things that are happening in the European Union, like Brexit and all, does that have anything to do with, uh, with your view? Um, is it just going to be uh, something that's going to pass and then the, revive, the European Union will become even stronger? That's my first question. Then the second, after he answers that, will be uh, you. How does uh, what's happened in Turkey, uh, is there any confirmation? I mean, this... Uh, Erdogan obviously was on top of this whole situation. This coup, I think he was really engineering things. But let's go back to you. Any, any confirmation or does uh, Brexit, uh, does it challenge your view or is it just, I mean, what's going to happen with Brexit? Is the, is the European Union going to become even stronger because maybe it's going to try to, uh, the uh, United Kingdom is going to try to get back into the European Union and then the Union will say, ha ha, we are now, we, we've proven our point. You need us. You're I, I have no idea because the Bible doesn't talk about how all of this will begin before the rapture. And uh, that's why I've always said, uh, and I said it today, I think, that the EU is a preparation in some way for the revived Roman Empire. And I don't know any Bible prophecies that would give a basis for uh, speculating based on the Bible what's going to happen between now and uh, the founding of the revived Roman Empire. So I have no idea what's going to happen. Your, your view about uh, what's happening in Turkey, any, any significance, any confirmation, or it just doesn't count? I would just say vaguely, cautiously, that the landscape the contours of the landscape as described by the biblical prophets, the geopolitical landscape, are coming into focus. But we're not there yet. And I wouldn't say this is that, which the prophet spoke of. I have been watching Turkey because of Ezekiel's emphasis on Turkey. I think it's going to emerge. I, I stated clearly, I believe we'll see Turkey emerge as an Islamist nationalist entity that will be incredibly powerful. I said that 12 years ago. I've watched it come into you know, fruition. And even if, forget biblical prophecy, geopolitically, <laughs> what's going on in Turkey is, is definitely profound. Okay. I want to ask you a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I don't understand if the sixth empire is Rome, yep. 
and the sixth empire is the revival. In other words, the seventh is, uh, well, the, fifth, the fourth empire is Rome, then the fifth is uh, the revived Roman Empire. I don't think the fourth is Rome. I'm sorry, it's Rome, uh, the fifth. And uh, then that would mean the sixth is the revived Roman or the revived empire that is associated with Rome because of the iron, et cetera. And uh, the, it's spoken of in Daniel 7 as a phase or aspect. He kept looking in the night visions and he saw these 10 horns that were part of the Roman Empire, how you can make it into the Ottoman Empire or the revival of no, the Ottoman I, Empire. I, again, I don't think that Daniel 2 or 7 reference Rome. Again, when I showed the maps, I said, look, Rome didn't crush Babylon. It was left out. Th that, that is one little thing that I'll guarantee you uh, does not erase the fact that uh, Rome took over the uh, it's, I'm not Greek saying it's Empire. Irrelevant. I'm not succession. saying it's irrelevant. Clearly, you know, Revelation brings it in. It is one right. of the beast empires. It's just that in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, because we begin, again, with a context, was a dream given to Nebuchadnezzar. And you read, what's the subject? A kingdom will come after you and, and replace yours. It'll be inferior. It'll replace yours. And then another and another. And then it specifically defines, it gives us the criteria to identify this fourth kingdom. Okay. It says it's the one that will crush all the others. And then when the rock strikes the feet, and let me actually hit on this because I didn't touch sure. it. It says that when the rock strikes the feet of iron and clay and they shatter, it specifically says in verses 30, chapter 2, verses 33 to 35, all of the others are destroyed at the same time. What are all the others? Babylon, think Iraq. Medo-Persia, think Iran. Greece. Now, if the Roman Empire were revived, even to the point of its greatest extent today, and the kingdom of Messiah came and crushed that kingdom, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece would not all be destroyed at the same time by virtue of the destruction of the Roman Empire. When we get to Revelation 13, you see, what, what I say is I go, no, the fourth empire is the Islamic Empire because it's the only empire in history that meets the biblical criteria of having crushed Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. What do they speak in Iraq today? Arabic. And so when you get to Revelation 13, it has the body of a leopard in, based on the symbolism in Daniel 7. That's Greece. It has the mouth of a lion, Babylon. It has the feet of a bear, Iran, Persia. Okay? The, this final beast is a composite of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Look at a map, guys. That doesn't describe the Roman Empire. Now, Tommy has said, well, this speaks of things like democracy and uh, different things like that. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, but that's not in the text. I'm just dealing with the most basic sort of starting point of geography. There's only one empire that meets. You, anyone can open an atlas and look at a map. I know we're Americans and half of us don't know where Iraq is and this sort of thing. But look, um, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just, you know, but, um, but look, you know, it, again, is our view, does our view align with the simple facts of history? And the Roman Empire simply fails to meet the, those basic criteria. Yeah, I did. I do believe it's the cultural contributions and the fact that Rome uh, dominated the world and now it's being revived, uh, whatever that is going to look like. But there is a passage in Romans, in uh, Daniel 7, that talks about mixing with the seed of men. And uh, if I had time, I could go in and show you that That's I believe in Daniel that, 2. That, what? That's in Daniel 2. Uh, yes, you're right. That's right, because it's related to the iron and the clay. Yeah. And uh, I could go in and show you where I believe that that's referring to cultural interchange. And so there would, well, you know be, what the word uh, there would be a biblical basis for the uh, contributions, the last phase of the revived Roman Empire, uh, including all the cultural things, because the emphasis is on the stone being cut without hands, it, and it smush, smashes the mem even the memory of it, it's blown mm -hmm. away never to be sure. remembered again, other than, you know, how many times you heard the disc jockey say, this song's gonna live forever, you know? In other words, it's the cultural expressions of these things uh, in, in the form of the kingdom of man. It's the works of the kingdom of man that are destroyed. Right. Corporately. 
So I agree with you regarding culture, and I think that, I actually think that this crushing empire, because that's the main way it's described, it crushes everything, it devours it, it crushes it with its feet, and then it devours the residue with its feet. Now, when we look at the Roman Empire, it was, as I said, a revenue collection machine. They conquered re rebels, they subdued peoples, but they allowed them to maintain their culture, their language, they allowed the various ancient religions, the exception, the um, collegium, whatever it was the exception, where the Jews were allowed to worship their God in Israel. Now that's the exact, that's not a crushing empire. The Islamic empire, wherever it goes, it crushes, it devours, it erases culture, it erases history. I would say this picture of this erasing entity far better describes the Islamic empire. You look at what they did when they burst forth out of Arabia. Within a hundred years, half of the ancient church, the heart of it was ripped out. All of the great missionary sending cities were destroyed. I mean, you know, you say ISIS is not Islamic. What ISIS is doing, you read the early conquests of the successors of Muhammad, it's identical. They didn't, the Romans came in because they wanted to collect taxes. The, the Muslims came in and just killed them and took the women and the money. And so today, what do you have? The residue left throughout the Middle East. What's happening? They are being crushed under feet like crumbs that are left. It matches the description of the Islamic Empire. The Roman Empire is, was a fairly tolerant empire in terms of ancient history. They didn't want to wipe the people out because they wanted the money to keep flowing back to Rome. So if we're looking at that, and then by the way, it says, in and that you saw the feet mixed with iron and clay, it says, it will be a mixed kingdom. And the word there used three times is Arab. It will be an Arab kingdom. Arab, mix. It's the same word. In the Aramaic, this is not some Bible code stuff, you know. This is the original language. If someone is just reading it in the original language, it says, in and that you saw the iron Arab, me Arab, mixed with iron and clay, it will not mix with the seed of men. It's kind of this cryptic riddle, but it says the kingdom will be an Arab kingdom. This is almost identical to where Daniel reads the handwriting on the wall and he goes, you know, and your kingdom's going to be divided, um, uh, Perez, and then it's given to the Paras, the Persians. He names the next kingdom that's coming. And I'm not saying this, but it seems to be a fairly, if you look at the original language, it is a hint at best that we need to consider. He says it's an Arab kingdom. Well, you can't reduce the Roman Empire to a uh, collection agency. Uh, it was an empire like the previous empires. And it's true, it got its culture primarily from Greek stuff, but at the same time they uh, did pioneer a lot of military uh, stuff like that and they ruled sure. over these people. Yeah. And you had other empires like the Persian Empire that was rather lax with uh, you know people groups that they did as well. So you're trying to obfuscate in my opinion the significance because that's an empire on the same standing and equality with those others. So just saying it's a tax thing and then talk about how cruel the uh, Muslims are is not an, an argument that uh, I'm just trying to read what the text says no it's not what the text says uh, it says it's going to crush and devour and I trample the residue but of you're, the you're put it you're coming in and emphasizing something to the neglect of the overall context and things but you but, agree that the Islamic Empire is a very different character than the Roman Empire uh, and that between the two the Islamic Empire does meet that description far better no, I don't think okay, it does well, because of, I, I wouldn't understand those passages in the same way you do. Again, the Romans simply adopted the Greek gods, just changed their names from Zeus to Jupiter, right. etc. Their literature was the same. You look throughout first century, the, the Jewish temple stood in Jerusalem. They allowed them to worship, the, practice Judaism. They didn't speak Latin. They spoke Greek. You know, this is not, this was not a culturally totalitarian empire compared, why do they speak Arabic? Why do they speak Arabic, you know, in, in northern Africa? Because but the revived is, Roman Empire will be totalitarian. It is an Arab supremacist force. It always has been from the very beginning. And it matches the description of the fourth kingdom far better than the Roman Empire. Now listen, again, just for clarity, I am not saying this is absolutely that. I am strongly convinced myself. All the, I came here today for this. I want the body of Christ. I want folks like you, I, don't, I doubt that you will, to acknowledge, yes, this view has some merit. Yes, the body of Christ as intercessors, as watchmen, 
we should be considering this view. It's not some outlandish, ridiculous Bible uh, newspaper exegesis view. It has biblical, solid, scriptural merit. And in light of what's unfolding in the earth right now, it's something that we need to pay attention to. Now, could I end up being wrong? Of course. Look, one thing I'm going to do is put my arm on the chopping block and guarantee I'm going to place all my bets. I'm going to get stuff wrong. All of us are, right? But if there's one arena of theology that we need to be humble regarding, it's eschatology, especially speculative eschatology. And the body of Christ deserves better than just to try to disregard people as some aberrant deviant because they're trying to work through the scriptures in a responsible way. And that's all I'm saying. I, I think that there's merit here that we need to pay attention to, that we need to consider. Could I be wrong? Sure, absolutely. But, you know, to say it's completely unbiblical and so forth, I, I just, I think we need to get past that. Well, I... Yeah, Augustine did say, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and all things, charity. That might be good for a divided church. And um, anyhow, I, I'm not... A the, Augustine also said that uh, a heretic has to be really uh, brilliant to make it appealing to other people. Yeah, now, and, and the devil <laughs> loves to find heretics where there are no heretics. Right. And that always and, divides uh, the church. Augustine could not have been heretical, right? <laughs> Well, I want to stand up and I want to ask a question. Uh, I've got one more question for these men, but I want to know, I do have three by five cards. How many of you have uh, valid questions that you would like to entertain, like me to receive? Uh, does anybody feel like they want a, want a three by five card? Otherwise, we'll just go to 530 and let them speak. Or if, uh, okay, you've got, uh, okay, let, let's go another um, about seven or eight minutes, and then we'll have about ten minutes to get three by five cards. Are we okay, going to have closing statements? Big pardon? Are we going to have closing statements? Uh, we probably will. Okay. I think we'll, we'll try to include that. But um, I wanted to ask Tommy, and then maybe five minutes each, um, what, uh, Tommy, is the extent of the dominion of the Antichrist? Because I know as I read your material and read Joel's material, there's a little bit of a difference there. So what do you say is the extent of his All dominion? I know is it's going to be a start off as a ten-nation confederacy uh, characterized as a revived Roman Empire. I have no idea. I don't think it's necessarily going to be half east, half west, or anything like that. Uh, I think it's going to be a ten-nation confederacy of some kind. And I don't care how many are in the European Union at this point. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, it's going to be a ten-nation confederacy, uh, and it's biblically viewed as a revival of the Roman Empire, of that uh, last empire. Joe, your uh, comments on the uh, dominion of the Antichrist. The second half is going to be global. I don't think it means he's going to take over the entire world and rule over the entire, but he's going to go global, put it that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would agree with Tommy. You know, the eight times it references the kingdom of the Antichrist, it always emphasizes ten. Ten horns, ten horns, ten horns, ten kings. This is the primary emphasis, therefore this is what we should emphasize. Now, the question always comes up, but Joel, it's, he's going to control every single last nation, every government. I think there's strong evidence that he will not control every single government. I think we have to look at the language that uses, you know, speaks of him controlling the whole world and having authority over all the world. I agree with that. I think if he is a Muslim, he has Muslims everywhere. Look, there's more Muslims in Germany than there are in Lebanon. You know, and the whole thing, you know, these guys say, well, Gog Magog, Psalm 83, they're all going to get wiped out. I calculated, I sat down and did all the populations. If you wipe out every single nation that anyone has ever suggested could possibly be in the Gog Magog invasion. I mean, all the Istans, all of the Middle East, all of North Africa, you still have over a billion Muslims because the most populous nations are Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, right? So you still have more Muslims than there are Protestants. So the idea that Islam is going away, it just doesn't work. That's literally if you wipe out every man, woman, and child. But that doesn't happen. Why? Because as we began at the beginning, we saw that at the return of Jesus, 
It's specifically the nations that surround Israel that are emphasized literally throughout the prophets as being judged. That is the emphasis of the prophets. Therefore, we should emphasize that part of the world. Now listen, what nations is he going to control? Because everyone goes, Joel, where's American Bible prophecy? Is he going to control America? Um, where the Bible is silent, we need to be extremely careful. I think he's going to have authority in every nation. Now, it says in Daniel 11:40 that some nations will escape his hand. It talks about Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. They'll escape his hand. What exactly that means is up for debate. Um, in Daniel 11:44 through 45, it speaks of what seem to be resistor nations. It says, news from the east and the north shall alarm him. Something seems to upset him, and he goes out and lashes out and rages. Um, uh, John Walvert agrees that that's probably talking about Russia and, uh, and China. And then in Daniel 9.26, it says, The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. To the end there shall be war. To the end there shall be war. Now listen, if there are wars, that is proof that there are resistor militaries. If there are resistor militaries, that is proof that there are some governments that he does not completely control. So the point is this, the scriptures emphasize the Middle East, we should emphasize the Middle East. What about all the other nations that it's silent on? We don't know, and we need to be very careful. And if we live in the United States, it's not our job. I, it drives me nuts when prophecy teachers say, oh, well, we're not there, so it must mean that we get wiped out. Okay, let's just give up, stop praying, you know, just call it quits. No, we're called to be intercessors and contend for the sphere of, of influence that he's given us and pray for this nation until it's gone. You know, we don't give up. If your spouse is sick, you don't stop praying. You continue to pray until it's too late. And I think that's our responsibility as the church. So again, we need to be cautious where the Bible is silent. We need to emphasize that which it emphasizes. Okay. If Implied that uh, all Muslims are going to be wiped out. I'm simply saying that Islam could lose their influence. But many, I don't many know teachers how have. that's going to happen. Let me go finish. out and hand out three by five cards to those who want it. Okay, Good. so I don't know how that's going to happen, but stranger things have happened. Nobody thought the Soviet Union was going to go down. Hardly, there are a few. I agree with you. Know, you. And, and I agree with strange you. things can happen, and I don't have to figure it out to understand what the Bible is actually saying. Yeah, I agree with you. Many people have said that, though. Many people have said, oh, they're all going to get wiped out. And right. I just go. Well, the implication is that I believe that since I'm up here. You know, so I just well, you to... said probably on the radio show. No, I said that they uh, are, you know, I meant they're going to lose their influence because, and I have also said in the past that we saw in the first Gulf War, when you hit the Muslims in the mouth, they back down. Uh, right. They wonder if they violated, uh, you know, like Muhammad, he went back after he, his first loss and wondered had he done something wrong. So uh, if they are successful, then they can t think that all is behind them. If they get blasted, then they tend to back down. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Anything can happen. Future has a way of throwing us curveballs. Right. There, you know? There's no prophecy about what's going to happen geopolitically during the church age, except in Acts 17 where he says God is uh, causing the uh, times and boundaries of nations to uh, rise and fall in order to maximize the preaching of the gospel. And the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's not uh, predicted in the New Testament for the church age. The be, the be, it well, happened. It happened. But the beginning of Ezekiel 38. Testament. Um, the, in the beginning of Ezekiel 38, I'll invade a land of unwalled villages. Of right, people that but that could have out. happened after the rapture. And, uh, I mean, I think it's going to happen after the rapture. I don't think it's going to happen during the church age. The restoration so, of Israel? No. Uh, it didn't have to happen. I'm gotcha, saying gotcha, the New okay. Testament does not talk about right. specifically the restoration of Israel. Gotcha. Don't ignore that guy in the back row. T don't, don't, don't give him a question. Well, then we won't have this guy up here give a question. I'm just, kidding. I'm just kidding with you. Where's the bouncers? Yeah. Okay. Um, this uh, is a question, I believe, for Joel. Uh, how can the Antichrist be Islamic if he violates its major tenet and declares himself to be God? Okay. Uh, was that Mark? 
That was Mark, yeah. Okay, so here's my question. What, what God does he proclaim himself to be? What God? Uh, well, he's going to, if he declares himself to be Any, God, I understand. I think uh, Like the God Mark of the Bible? Is, yes. Okay, because the scriptures are very clear. He will blaspheme the Most High for three and a half years. He will speak unheard of things against the God of God. So clearly he's not claiming to be the God of the Bible, right? That would be fundamentally Texas contradictory. Texas place in the temple of God, claiming yeah, because, to be God. Well, what the, <laughs> no, 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 but it's clear that he blasphemes the name of God. So he's not blaspheming himself. Right, in, in order to replace God, because you go back to Isaiah 14 and Satan's original goal was to ascend above of so, the mountain of God, second, and it's being carried right. out during the tribulation through the Antichrist. So essentially my answer to this is that because I am someone that says, here's what I believe, I believe this is his theology. It's very, it's very easy to say, well, how does this work? But no one else is willing to say what they believe the Antichrist will believe. But this is a problem for every view. Because Islam's not going to disappear, it's not going to get wiped out. So you go, well, how is it that all the Muslims are going to follow the Antichrist if he supposedly claims to be God? I don't believe he claims to be God. Because it says in Daniel 11, he has a God. How can he claim to be God and have a God? I believe what 2 Thessalonians is stating is that the act of sitting in God's seat is itself a direct defiance of the God of the temple. He he's blasphemes God. He declares himself to be superior to God. It's a, because 2 Thessalonians is actually directly quoting uh, Daniel 11.36. Paul's almost directly quoting it. And so, you know, we have to wrestle through this a little more carefully. Because we go, what God? People go, well, the God, the God of the Bible. I mean, he's not claiming to be the God of the Bible. It says he blasphemes the God of the Bible. It says he speaks unheard of things against the God of the Bible. And it says there in Daniel 11, again, 36 through, it lays out his theology. It says he denies... Uh, Elohim Ab, that, I believe that's the God of the Bible. It says no, shows no regard for the God of the Bible. It says he shows no regard for the desire of women. You know, some folks go, he's a homosexual. No. I, I think it's a messianic reference to the Messiah. That's my opinion. Right. Yeah. Different people debate. It's, a, it's the twofold denial. He denies the Father and the Son. That's exactly what 1 John 2.22 says. He denies the Father and the Son. He shows no regard for any other God. But there is a God that he does honor, and it's called a God of forces, a God of fortresses, a God of jihad, a God of war. So we have to, as we ask these questions, people always zero in on one or the other. Well, he's an atheist. And, you know, we have to take all of the descriptions into, and it's a difficult picture. I acknowledge it. But I think what he's doing by setting himself up in the temple, because you have to understand, this is my throne. This is where, from a, from a uh, Near Eastern perspective, the, the temple is the throne of God. It's the earthly throne where, where any gods, not just the God of the Bible, extends his authority over his, his nation. So when he sits himself up in God's seat, that itself is the act. It never says he verbally, it never says he speaks and says, I'm God. It's the act itself. And so in, that's, that's my view. Um, you know, again, but if you go, okay, well, that's ridiculous. Muslims would never submit to him. I go, then what are you going to do with a billion Muslims in the earth? Right? No matter what, the Muslims aren't going away. The problem doesn't go away. Name, name a system or a belief. Go, well, he's a New Ager, he's an atheist, he's a humanist. It's always a problem. It doesn't go away. This is not just a problem for the Antichrist theory. It's difficult to work through regardless of your position. So that's all I'm saying is we need to take the full counsel of Scripture into consideration. Look, there's going to be crazy miracles and deception, as, as Tommy talked about, and you know, what the future will hold is yet to be seen. But that is certainly not an issue that says it's impossible, he never could be, because it's a sa the same problem can be applied to any other perspective. Okay, let me, let, uh, there's, there's another question for I Joel. know that I get to respond, at least historically in debates, you get to respond to someone's <laughs> answer. Well, we, we, we're sticking to a schedule because of the time of the dinner, so but Joel, he, another he's question. violating scripture at this point. Okay, if, if uh, Joel, if the Antichrist is Muslim, why will the Jewish people believe him? Well, the Bible never says the, Antichrist, the Jews are going to accept the Antichrist as their Messiah. That's an unbiblical, historical idea um, based on misinterpretation of one verse. You know, if someone comes in his own name, him you will receive. It says nothing about the Antichrist. I think Tommy agrees with me. Yes, on that. I do. 
Um, but it says that he comes with enough political capital or maybe leverage that he's able to enter into or strengthen this covenant. So he comes with deceit. He comes uh, initially where they're able to you know, engage him, but then he reveals himself in the bin point. So uh, it's, a, it's a misnomer that they're going to receive him as their The Messiah. Hebrew word gibor translated firm covenant could mean a imposed covenant. Yeah, it could be so it, leverage. It, I don't know what it means actually, right. but here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 it says, talking about the man who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God yeah. or object to worship. That's what you were talking about and you assume that a person can't blaspheme and believe that they're taking the, face, the place of God. Those are not antithetical ideas. You can blaspheme and believe you're taking the place of God and it, then it says so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, not the temple of Zeus, displaying himself as being God. That's what the text says. He is going to display himself as being God. But you're making God. the fallacy, the false, you're, you're, you're saying that word because it's the same word must mean the same thing. That's a fallacious argument. Well, look at the context. It's, a, it's called the false, No, it's the false you transference. Ha you have to look at the, There's uh, only how one words word. are controlled in a context. And how would you say that he, you're, you're saying that he goes, I'm God, he's an idiot. He, he claims no, I'm to not. be God. He claims to be God and blasphemes God. He, yes, How is that blaspheme means he speaks against him. Uh, you know, and but he says he is him. Well, guess what? Jesus was crucified uh, for blasphemy because he claimed to be God. We're gonna. That's not speaking unheard of things against God. We're gonna terminate because we have to uh, due to uh, time constraints. I'd like everybody to give a round of applause to uh, Tommy Ice and Joe Richardson. And um, I, I, do, I do really want us to remember something about this debate, and it's an academic debate. I, I kind of like this kind of a setup because we discuss stuff. But we, we need to leave here and remember that this is just really a very small, small issue. We have a main task, and that is to share Jesus Christ. So let's never forget that.